With Nails by Richard E. Grant. With Nail and I. Spring 1985. Wanted. Boy dances in Dubai. No previous experience necessary. This ad appeared in the stage newspaper in a prominent black box on the vacancies pages, and probably still does. After nine months of resting, dancing in Dubai begins to seem like a serious option. At the close of Orwell's Big 84, Prospects had seemed swimming, a Plays and Players' most promising newcomer nomination, and a role in Les Blair's satire about advertising for the BBC, Honest, Decent and True. This television break seemed the ticket. I had a sense that it would open up some possibilities somewhere. The transmission date became a fixed point with every chip of hope stacked for the big gamble. Such is my state of mind that when I chance upon one of those magazine surveys that states your ideal body weight for your height and type, I realize that at six foot two of medium build, I ought to weigh 12 stone rather than 11. My wife, Joan, whose patience is bubblegum stretched by now, tells me about Dreas Reinecke, the body trainer who transformed Christopher Lambert into Tarzan for Greystoke. I discover he was from South Africa and grew up 200 miles from where I did in Swaziland. He takes me on, and gradually, flesh grows where only ribcage has mirrored back before. The ritual of pumping and pushing gives some vague purpose to the weak. Marooned, becalmed, beached, and increasingly bleached of self-confidence, the magazine rack at my local W. H. Smith's in East Twickenham provides some escape. I sometimes make a mental inventory of fellow readers and regulars, and assume that they too are among the 95% 40,000-odd unemployed members of equity. All too frequently, I have a call from my agent with news of an audition for something humiliating. No Frankenstein? Uh, yes. Well, I've read it, but not recently. Got a pen? The BBC Religious Department are doing a drama doc in Wales looking at the dialectics, I think that's what they said, of faith and medical advances. Not quite sure, but they're interviewing for monsters. I head for the building next to the Wogan Theatre and meet the director in a cramped office occupied by two typists, clacking out bulletins and contracts. Uh, would you mind taking off your shirt? What, here? Uh, yes, sorry, but the uh, normal interview room is being rewired. This is a first. As my buttons obey, the two typers' eyeballs shift briefly upwards without missing a beat. Uh, thank you. Could you read a couple of pages for me? My relief at buttoning up again is matched by the disappointment in his eyes. My torso had clearly not been up to par. In, uh, in this scene, the monster argues with and then attacks the doctor. Just take your time and then have a go. Even I am startled by the exorcist gutturals that issue from my gizzard. I am monstrous and possessed. The sound of typing stops. Eyes stare, and when I drop the script page and have both hands gripped round the director's neck, I feel primed to hop down to contracts and sign on the dotted line. As free therapy, it's worth the train fare alone. Well, I don't quite know what to say. Uh, nobody has done anything quite like that before. The man's eyes are inspecting the floor while his left hand massages his reddening neck. Later, I put through a call to my agent. How did it go? she inquires. Oh, gave it my best shot, though I must admit that maybe my torso wasn't quite what they were looking for, but I think the reading made some kind of impression. Well, they're still seeing people because we have another client going in this afternoon, but I'll let you know if we hear anything. Two hours, days, weeks go by, and not having heard a peep, I have to take this on board and get me down to the rack, to oblivion among the faces photographed who are it, or about to be it. David and Philippa Conville, with whom I had worked at Regent's Park Open Air the previous year, have mentioned my name to Michael Whitehall, an agent they think might help me. Go smart, is their advice. I get smart, and go to smart offices in St. James. Fish tanks and secretaries and phones going. Take a seat. Michael has a drawly, sneery voice that seems to emanate from his sawn-off shotgun nostrils. Friendly and funny sarcastic, we size one another up across his desk. He sits in a high-back medieval throne with what look like turrets on each side of the back. Between him and me rests the jagged jaw of a shark. We were once attacked by one of those. Shark? He raises an eyebrow. In Africa, Mozambique coast. What am I supposed to talk about? He is very direct and says that while he is possibly interested, he obviously cannot do anything until I've seen your work. I mentioned Honest, Decent and True, the BBC film to come, and uh, thank you very much for giving me the time and 
Yes, I will definitely keep in touch. Edward Fox on the line for you, Michael. Can you take it? Into the street, which now seems momentarily paved with golden possibility. This bounding euphoria lasts a couple of days. Everything is now fixed on honest, decent and true. Sunday, 13th of January, 1986. Six interminable months drag by until Honest, Decent and True is on BBC Two. Hollow guts watching through the cracks in ten fingers strapped to my visog. Christ, is that what I look like, sound like, walk like? You're funny. My wife's reaction is edged with a distinct note of surprise. This note of affirmation is like a benediction. You live with each other all year round in a kind of close-up, and all of a mosey tonight, watching... You are seen in cinemascope, and if she is surprised by what is beaming back, then all is clearly not lost. 10 a.m. on Monday. It's... Hello, Michael here. Come and have lunch. Fast forward through the pristine white napkins and three courses of cautious praise, topped off with, I think I could really do something for you, assuming you're willing, and I'd like to represent you. Done. 1st of July. Mary Selway is casting a film for Handmaid with a peculiar title, with some bloody thing or other. Says it's a comedy, but no doubt with a different title. The next day, a package flops through the letterbox. Withnell and I, by Bruce Robinson. Light bulb recognition of the author as actor. I've seen him as Ben Volio, in Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet, and most recently in The Story of Adele H. Apprehension that this pop star pretty actor wouldn't be capable of writing anything other than a nursery rhyme to Narcissus. Two pages into the script, and an ache has developed in my gonads. I am both laughing out loud and agonized by the fact that the Withnail part is such a corker that not in a billion bank holidays will they ever seriously consider me. This conviction gets stronger as the script gets better and better. Never before or since have I read something that conveys what goes on in my head so accurately. It's a grey, stormy day, and I get the tube wearing a 1940s Oxfam khaki raincoat, carrying a leather-bound copy of Robinson Crusoe to read on the way. Step out of Notting Hill Gate tube into a combination typhoon monsoon and head through the downpour to the address I've been given. I'm met by Mary Selway, who, in the way of all casting ladies, is instantly reassuring and near-maternal in calming nerves and wobbling egos. This way. And I follow her leggy, toothy self into a dining room, and am offered a cup of tea. Don't touch your hair, she advises as she leaves the room. Hear the mumblings of another actor reading in another part of the house and assume he has got the job. This is confirmed when I spy Bill Nye past the window on his way out. Cemented when I hear Miss Selway declare in the friendliest of tones, We'll call your agent. Bye, darling. Her head is round the door. Come in. Relax. Like the script? Really funny. Herr Robinson is mid-lager opening, leather jacket, jeans, fag in more, and hair flopped to his shoulders, like a lost member of the Rolling Stones. Jesus! he exclaims at my appearance. Caught in the rain, I say, sideways out of a shit-eating grin attempt to relax. What's that, a Bible? Uh, oh, uh, this, no, um, uh, a novel. For the tube. Oh, fuck. What is it? Uh, uh Rob Robinson Crusoe. Defoe, by way of explanation. Brilliant book, one of my favourites. Do you read Dickens? What is this, hippie mastermind? Yes. Can I read with now for us? Sure. I ask if I can audition standing up as I'm reading the kitchen scene that opens the film, and sense that being on my pins might just mobilise whatever talent might be lurking somewhere. The eye character, read by Mary, identifies matter growing in the kitchen sink, which is crammed with the unwashable. Adrenaline, like a rocket of fear, shoots through my system and ignites upon the order to fork it! My script goes flying, my fingers missiling towards Robinson's face, and the morose little fucker laughs. He seems even more surprised than I am. Scrabbling around the floor for the dismembered script, whose metal clips had snapped, he asks whether I had attacked any other directors. Not yet, I lie. Can you come back tomorrow and read another scene with another actor? You betcha, sweet... Twinkle chopped, baby. Fourth of July. I now get to read with another actor rather than Mary's monotone. Paul McGann's the man, and as blue eyed and infuriatingly bushy tailed as you wouldn't want anyone else quite to be in such circumstances. He is apparently casual, confident, and chugging down a beer with Brewski Robinson. Seventh of July. 
turns out I'm now reading with four different thesps, and while hoping above hope, I begin to wonder whether I'm being used as some kind of willing stooge to shortlist the I character, while the real contender for my part suns himself in Mallorca, doing his deal on a mobile. 8th of July, and it's just Michael Maloney and me. Over and over we do scenes, two hours working and gnashing at the script. Bruce is cracking open the ales, and I wonder whether this is out of brain-busting frustration or flickers of hope. 9th of July. How long can this rack be winched? By five, we're sent packing with a handshake, and we'll be letting you know today one way or the other. Michael and I schlep to the tube station. He makes for the public phone box, and I hear him tell his agent that even if they do offer him the part, he doesn't want to do it. I am astonished. Why not? I just have problems with the script. I'm sure they'll still offer you the withnail part. Going down the rush hour escalators, my body feels time suspended, shocked into immobility by this turn of events. They had been casting for a pair with chemistry. So what were my chances now? Walk home in direst droop of jaw, planning a change of profession. To what? retorts Joan with an overflow of impatience. It's only a bloody part, not a lunar landing. Michael Whitehall calls. You got the part if you want it. Some kind of scream must have hurled from my mouth, because Joan's face is two inches away and registers startle. Share the ear hole for congratulations. Grab my wife, squeeze, jump, hug, blub, and make for the sofas to jump up and down. Brain donkey noises are emanating from my bowels. Yeah! I have a bone-deep conviction that this is the break. I suspect the sure, centered sense of something happens rarely, and some part of me is grateful that I am conscious of it now, and not in the midst of nostalgia and disappointment years down the line. 11th of July. Bruce greets me with, Well, Granty, we're going to make a fucking masterpiece. Paul arrives and we read. His hair is similar in length to Bruce's, and sitting together they have a likeness that aptly fits his character, which is Bruce twenty years ago. Mary so is hugging and kissing and I told you sewing by lunchtime, and Paul is confirmed and contracted. Bruce claps a paw across my shoulder on the way out and says, I'd like you to lose about a stone to look really wasted. Skipping, levitating, long jumping, I'm airborne back to the underground and on my way to Boots for weight off powder. A lead role in a first film that isn't written by Rumpelstiltskin about topples my equilibrium. It is ridiculous that an offer of work could be so instrumental in restoring a sense of self-worth, but it does. This pre-rehearsal weekend is sunny, beautiful, calm, and love to the hilt of its hours, pulsed through with this part. Love is made, shops are shopped, vases are flowered, and talk is peppered with possibility. Our baby is baking, and we are nearing seven months safe after three previous miscarriages at three months. 14th of July. Everything feels like a virgin first, from the chauffeur-driven bends that motors me down to the studios to the meeting with George Harrison, who is Handmade Films' chief honcho, aside from being one of the Fab Four. Bruce is incredibly patient, but knows exactly how he wants the lines delivered. Nothing is improvised, and the luxury of the writer being the director short-circuits any doubt as to what the author might mean. A couple of weeks have passed since the audition, and costumes have been fitted. The 60s revisited, our own backgrounds mined for experiences, hair and makeup tests completed, and the script known by heart. Bruce decides to cast Richard Griffiths in the Uncle Monty role because he's so sweet and simpatico like Billy Bunter, which ensures that Monty will not be perceived as some saturnine predator. This film is bittersweet, sweet and sour, like King Curtis's definitive sax version of A Whiter Shade of Pale, is Bruce's oft-quoted mantra. The comedy comes from character and situation. There are no jokes, no poncing. While Paul and I understand the theory of this, the practice is still eluding us, and cruelest yet is the day Bruce has the camera team and script supervisor in for a rehearsed read-through. Instinctively, Paul and I are seduced into trying to perform, as they are the first audience we have experienced. Working to explicate our characters comes across as commenting on them, or third-eyeing, and it's disastrous. The tension is leavened somewhat by a casting session for the drug dealer, Danny. He is based on a record shop bloke near the Central Drama School who did a sidetrack in drugs in the 60s. Ralph Brown turns up, barefooted with painted black fingernails, long wig, shades, eyeshadow, attitude, and a pair of those bell-bottom pants with crisscross string where a zip might be. He is it, 
and as good as get an offer from Bruce there and then. 21st of July. While all this can we or can't we get this comic stuff right was occupying time and space, nothing prepared for the horror that happened this morning. Joan is ashen and saying, I think my waters are broken. She's only seven months pregnant. Bewildered and panic-stricken and ignorant, we get into the car and career along to Queen Charlotte's Maternity Hospital in the rush hour. Labour ward. Wheeled along and sharp turned into a ward, green curtains drawn, and I know by the look and sound and whispered stuff that we're in trouble. I hold Joan's hand tight, and her face is contorted with the onset of pains and the disbelief that this is happening. Over the next four hours, the sister and doctors gradually give me information. It is coming crisscrossed with percentages and charts and probability. We have a name already, Tiffany, as we know she is a girl. And when she is born, there is no sound, no cry, no sight of her. But just the terrible rush of hands and doctors and nurses doing something in a huddle for half an hour, like half an eternity. A doctor comes away and has tears in his eyes and says words that are unbearable to hear, unbearable to say. Her lungs were too small. We tried everything we could to save her. We're so sorry. Were and could ricochet through us. How can this be the past tense? We're here now. Joan is just shaking, as am I. Our baby is handed to my stricken wife first. And had I all the powers of Mars and miracles, I would give this child life. After I don't know how long, my baby is put in my arms, hand, for she is the size of a little bird. She is warm but dead and perfect. Ten toes, ten fingers, eyes, mouth, all broken, no breath. Joan accepts a job in Sicily coaching Christopher Lambert for the Sicilian. She's not keen to go but it seems better to be abroad while I am filming on location in the Lake District than to be alone at home with a baby's room that has no infant. 29th of July. I want you and Paul to get absolutely legless tonight. Stay up all night, come in first thing tomorrow, and we'll stagger through the whole screenplay. I want you to have a chemical memory of what it's like to be arsehole beyond within Snape. Wasted. Fucked. Horizontal, says Bruce. Since trying every alcohol variation in teenagerdom and never succeeding in keeping any down for more than half an hour, I know this planned Walpurgisnacht is going to be some trial. Joan thinks the idea completely insane, and in the light of what has happened to us, no doubt it is. Get a couple of bottles of champagne from the off-license, don't eat, and start off at around nine. Any publican's fart would be capable of rendering me askew, so it is no surprise that by 9.30 I have already lurched to the loo for the first of what will be many hurling up visits thither. By about 2 a.m., my innards have obviously acquiesced and alcohol does stay down, and there is now a serious focus on measuring out my intake so that I maintain the state until dawn. My bereaved and bewildered spouse has retreated to bed with mutterings of, Wanker, why don't you just try acting? 30th of July. 9 a.m., and I am dragged out into the car and driven to Shepperton, where there is a generous wet bar laid out in the corner. Fearing that I am not quite far enough gone for Bruce, I fill a large tumbler to the three-quarter mark with neat vodka. What to top it off with? To get it to go down? Aha! I spy with my totally bleary eye a row of Pepsi cans beckoning. Grab the ring pull, spill some, and frots the last quarter of the glass with liquid black. I put the can down and lift the tumbler to my chops, hold my breath, which is Vulcan stithy by now, and gloop the bubbling Pepsi bomb down in one. Burp, eyes squirt tears of shock, and in a nanosecond the whole fucking room is turning in on itself. Bruce and Paul arrive and start laughing, and we start rehearsing. And I suppose because we know this script to Bogner and back, the words are firmly enough lodged not to get displaced by the alcoholic onslaught. I must have fallen as my trousers are gaping at the knee, both knees, lurching and crying and laughing and flailing and the more it goes on the more hysterical are Bruce and Paul. This limbless lunacy gets us almost all the way through the script. French windows line the far wall with a narrow side glass door into the garden. An ocean of nausea bolts through my system and brain cells convene upon one single thought. 
get through that door now. Blazing sunlight and fluorescent green grass come at me fast as a flying Persian carpet of champagne vodka cocktail comes spewing from my gullet and I still feel duty-bound to carry on the dialogue. On my knees, vomiting, crying and berating the wide world and its invisible masters. Pass out. 31st of July. When I grope my way downstairs, Bruce has left this message on the answer phone. Granty, you did it. Breakthrough. Gonna make a fucking masterpiece, boy. 1st of August, Penrith. No turning back, boyo, is boying through my brain as I ginger towards the bar to meet the assembling crew, all of whom smoke and drink, and oh, fuck, will they suss that I do neither, playing this part. Everyone knows this film is being made for a flea's pittance, but loyalty, friendship, and a sense of what this script might be, if pulled off, pervades us all. 2nd of August. Minibus together out to the location in Wet Sleddle, supposedly the wettest corner of the United Kingdom, through numerous gates up to a mountainside to an abandoned cottage on the Waterboard estate. Perfect. Exactly like the script suggests. 3rd of August. Much fixing and flagging the black drapes round the door, rain machine for the window, and seemingly endless tweaking of lights to affect the eye character's beat-up Jaguar headlamps outside. When all is dingy and complete, I am doused down with tepid water, and I reprise the drowning rodent look with which I first presented myself to Robinson. Richard Griffiths arrives in the evening, roasted and in agony from too much sun, which doesn't stop him enjoying five courses, cigs and plenty vino and tales of thespia. Catchphrases from the script get repeated all over the shop. It is a particular pleasure to hear a Malta macho electrician come up with Uncle Monty's As a youth I used to weep in butcher shops. The scene of Withnalian complaint about the lack of proper nourishment climaxes with my grabbing a fencing rapier, standing bolt upright like an erection and braying I want something's flesh! This gets a laugh from the crew and is the first time I experience that thing you always seek, the click, when you innately know something has worked. Robinson is onto it like a laugh-seeking missile. I know in my gonads that this has worked, and bet it will be the take that's used. 16th of August. You were lucky you got in to see me, Granty, says Bruce, inhaling like it was his last request on death row. Selway had shown me your fat mug in spotlight three fucking times, and each time I refused to see your unknown boat, and she says, Well, you have to. He's in the next room waiting. What the fuck? Ready to give you the heave-ho, and next fucking thing, you're flying at me with a script and bellowing, Fork it! Got the part. Two words. Thought if you can do that, maybe I can work the little rat up into something. But you had to lose the weight. Right porky you were when you came in. During this harangue, I detected the begrudging tones of friendship in the beaten way, as young Hamlet was to say. 14th of September. The art department have located a pub in Westbourne Grove, off the West Way, that is suitably nicotine-stained and has the external advantage of a council tower block, lone toothing in the distance, for when the two thesps escape the violent advance of the Irish Frankenstein within. Extras are selected on the basis of their facial decrepitude and propensity to chain-smoke relentlessly, which they do. The prop boys are offering variations of non-alcoholic beer to try, as I am supposed to down a pint in one. Moving my head first and letting the eyeballs catch up a second after mimics the effect of alcohol well enough for a crew member to ask whether I'm a reformed drunk, which I interpret as a great compliment. Here at the bar, Paul and I hatch the plot to hit on Uncle Monty for cash on a weekend at the cottage in the country. We're interrupted by a vast Irish punter who denounces us as perfumed ponces. I am directed to swivel on my bar stool with some bravado intact and refute with... What fucker said that? By happenstance, I had just bitten off a mouthful of bread to help swill down the pint of lager, with the result that when faced with the mountain of Irish threat, I smiled a tepid, it's not me, sir, kind of smirk, with a bread lump that resembled an additional tooth in my face. Bruce laughed hard and long, and the more I tried to fathom why, the more he yelped. Some key has been found, and I understand for the first time in practice, rather than just theory, that playing someone funny, you have willfully to imagine that nothing is funny. All Withnail's outrage at the world he wants to put to rights, plus a Yorkshire pit's worth of self-hatred, make for a dented soul in search of some panel beating. Bruce has been banging on about comedy being a very serious business, and while thinking I have grasped this, it is only now that it is all clicked and cogged. 17th of September. 
The opening scenes, set in Withnell and I's Camden Town squat, are filmed in a condemned house in Notting Hill Gate. This allows the art department to wreck relentlessly, although they need to do very little to the kitchen, which already had a sink that stinks. Someone says the matter has been growing for a month, but I don't bother to verify this. The whole place has the perfect sense of history and near collapse. As the two characters have not eaten anything for 36 hours and are out of booze supplies, the whole situation is desperate. Normality is left behind as the eating of soup becomes a near nuclear bowl of contention, which culminates with Withnell threatening to do the washing up, with its much misplaced zeal as Thatcher declaring, We're going into the Falklands! Full frontal method acting is required for stripping down to baggy wise, and I'm basting myself with deep heat while berating the world for the temperature being like Greenland in here, in a menthol perfumed vapour, fingering a rubber glove for warmth and bemoaning the lack of work. Why doesn't Gilgood retire? The manics have set in, feel completely crazed and possessed, combusting with desperation and disgust. Painting myself with the cream and wearing the scratchy wool coat sends my system into irritability overdrive, which speeds up and motors the mania required. Working on Bruce's theory of comedy reality in direct proportion to actual pain cues me in, and, he assures me, the deeper the rage and sense of injustice, the greater will be the comic result. This script has no jokes, it's cumulative and has to be real, otherwise it's just a load of old wobbly bollocks. Quite. Mine, right now, feel the first of the menthol approaching. Please, God. All that separates my scrotum and the unstoppable menthol fumes is a rib of cotton Y-front. So I turn tail, grab a towel and rub a neutralizing line of Nivea as a firebreak to prevent ball ache. Or perhaps flaming gonads. Ah, all this for art. Seven shooting weeks and a couple of weeks rehearsal, plus the week of audition and recall, total ten between my first fork it and actually forking it. With a crew of seasoned professionals, home cooking style producers, and three virgins to feature films in Paul, myself and Bruce, though he had acted and written for film, and all the incredible highs and the unbearable sorrow of Jones and my personal loss, coming to the end doesn't seem possible, the whole process being so intense and funny. But the promise of a partnership of sorts with Bruce that would last beyond the final rap is of some comfort. The last scene is shot. Rap is called, and it's over. I just stand in the dark and quell a terrible lurch of blub. I handed out my presents, vodka bottles for the camera crew and Bruce, beer for the boys, and homemade amateur cartoons of each crew member to say thanks. Corks pop, plastic cups are filled, and a mixed chorus of good on your boys. Check that I have my wallet, which is an antique crocodile first day of filming gift from Bruce and know that the tears flooding my tired fizzog are not crocs. Paul had of the producer and Bruce have had silver hip flasks engraved with Ralph Steadman's trademark, Withnan and I, scrawl, as gifts for the cast and crew. 8th of December. Warder Street Screening Room, 7pm. Rough cut, not fully colour graded, some sound effects still to fill in, without credit titles. I sit in the back row. I can hear my heart pounding at its ribcage prison to get out and begin to feel slightly damp all over. Hold Joan's small Scottish hand tight. She leans near and kisses my neck. Handmade Films logo starts as a dot centre screen and then comes at you like a fast train accompanied by the unique whine of King Curtis giving it a whiter shade of pale. Credits do come up and when I see my name I am gently tipped over the other side and want to weep that my father is not alive to see this. You were great, whispers Joan. My eyeballs swivel at her, as if she is Judas revisited. Let's go and have a drink. Into the pub, and Paul, who is as chipper as can be, puts his arm round my shoulder and says, We've done it! Fucking great! You are great, Paul. I feel like I'm like at my own funeral. What do you think, Grant? asks Bruce. Fucking good flick we've made. Always a killer to see yourself for the first time. It's why I never let you see any of the rushes. I stand with a glass of ginger ale like a stunned warthog. I can't stand this any longer. Let's go, pleadingly to Joan. Watching myself taught me that the self-obsession of a first viewing inevitably obliterates all judgment. By the time I saw the film with a packed BAFTA preview audience, it was possible to see the film that I'd originally found so funny as a whole, rather than as a catalogue of my own shortcomings. 
and people laughed a lot at Paul and me speaking Bruce's words. I had no notion that almost without exception every film offered since would be the result of having played an alcoholic out-of-work actor. Withnell and I led to working with Altman, Coppola and Scorsese, to name but three, and they never changed the title. Warlock, 11th of January, 1988. It's Michael. Got an audition for you at the Four Seasons Hotel off Park Lane. American producer, won an Oscar last year for Platoon. Sean Connery role, he turned it down. Tough adventure thriller type thing. Apparently they saw Withnell in Los Angeles. Script arrives with a biker, and I speed through it. The Warlock Hunter role requires, well, Sean Connery, 20 years ago. Resolve to look as tough as possible, which seems ludicrous, but get up in cowboy boots, jeans and leather jacket with slick back hair, and get off to the hotel all the while intoning a silent mantra, My name is Bond, James Bond, my... This hotel is soundproof by carpeting, and my boots sound like ballet slippers. Arnold Copelson, the newly Oscar producer, and Steve Miner, the director, greet me at the door of the suite. Mind doing a bit of reading? I attempt to lower my voice to what it might have been had I been blessed with demolition-sized bollocks and growl. They let me gruff through a page and then interrupt with, Can you do a Scottish accent for us? Highland fling it, probably doing a dialect tour of Inverness via Aberystwyth. That is so neat. You English guys, how do you do this stuff? Leave half an hour later on first-name terms. Thanks, Arnold. Thanks, Steve. We'll be calling your people. True to their word, I get a call next day and an offer. Is this the call from the coast that actor autobiogs are signposted by? 20th of January. After a ten-hour flight in the nose of a 747, L.A. stretches to the left and right, and through my porthole, like a railway train miniature mountainscape, stands the Hollywood sign. 22nd of January. Read through at Lionsgate Studio. Julian Sands, who is playing the warlock, says the movie is basically a kind of cartoon, chase movie, action, special effects, horror, and clearly commercial. I meet Bo, the Wrangler stunt coordinator, who's going to teach me how to use the whip my character brandishes. Let's get down to the car park, find some space. We cowboy boot click heels to the tarmac. Now you gotta get in the right gear and all, Dick. Uh, sorry, my name's Richard. Never been called Dick. To my face, that is. This flies off into the blue stratosphere without any response other than, OK, Rich! Bo is too busy shunting me into a black alpaca jacket, gloves and racing helmet to concern himself with my neurotics. For your protection, believe me, I've seen some nasty stuff go down with folk who ain't prepared. I'm ten feet above myself, looking down at Swazi Boy, doing Indiana Jones cracks and swirls with a twelve-foot coil of cowboy whip, and Bo enthusiastically offering instruction and encouragement. Two arse-busting hours later, drenched from the gruel of swing, curve, shuffle, withdraw, and thwack, my right arm feels as if it's been wired up to an artificial wanking machine. 25th of January. Pull up at a warehouse that looks like it's in a movie starring itself as the ideal location for stranglings. Get kitted out in a knee-length coat of coyote skins with hidden shoulder enhancement to beef me out. Bewigged, bewhipped, bestubbled and becoated, I'm very grateful that the assembled seamstresses and passers-by are not openly laughing at this attempted transformation from stick insect to Steve Reeves. They have made me look and feel bigger, and I realize that everything here does. They don't refer to the Pacific as the sea, it's the ocean. The stretch limo, the triple-decker sandwiches that could feed a family of six. 28th of January. Few free days before heading to the Boston location in New York, New York. Dazzling. Flying in at dusk, I can clearly see the Empire State, Chrysler, Liberty, and the dark oblong of Central Park. Later, crossing Queensboro Bridge in my chauffeur-driven limo, I swear I have a mini hovercraft levitating under my arse. My head is jammed with Gershwin going gaga. Yes, I have seen this skyline of scrapers all my movie-going life, but Jesus, this is that Coke slogan come true. It's the real thing. Into, onto, and within Manhattan, and push button down the window, despite the Arctic air out. Swazi boy, fix your lugs on that sound. Steam jets like breath from the road, and it's taxi driver. Horns honking, and maybe Gene Kelly's gonna skedaddle by. Sirens wailing somewhere close by, 
and its shaft, and Papa was a rolling stone. Boom, boom, boom. Arrive at the Algonquin Hotel. Put on the thermals, and bound down the stairwell, and into 44th Street, and run to Times Square on Broadway. Bright, brash, bursting with people, and I feel about as alive as I think I ever will be. Added to which is the sweet jelly roll of having a great friend, Alan Corduna, previewing in Carol Churchill's play Serious Money, which is just transferred from the Royal Court Theatre in London to the Royal Theatre on Broadway. Gulp some ice air and meet Alan backstage. You want to tread a Broadway board, he asks. It's like the movie said it would be. Naked light bulb, air still strained with perfumed human, and the last stragglers struggling into their furs. Alan has planned the sightseeing tour, Rockefeller Plaza to see the open-air skaters, Radio City Music Hall, up Fifth Avenue to the Plaza Hotel, just as F. Scott Fitzgerald said it would be. Into Central Park, and on cue it starts snowing, topping up the nightfall. Almost black and white, and as near as damn it to the credits of Woody Allen's Manhattan. Then to the preview of Serious Money, which is how you could describe the bejeweled punters. It's a fast, foul-mouthed City of London comedy, and meets with deadly silence, like the gagged fox heads swathed round wrinkly necks. The interval applause is more a retarded hand clap, and the man to my right growls, I don't come to the theatre to hear people say cunt fucking disgusting. Come on, Hazel, we're out of here. 1st of February. I take a shuttle flight to Boston to resume warlock work. First day of shooting, and we're in a mock 17th century village, shooting the opening sequence with extras, camera cranes, geese, children, and sub-zero temperature in this cocaine-snowed landscape. Big test. Will the crew laugh when they see me for the first time? Makeup and wig and coyote coated and bewhipped, I manfully stride out and silently survey the small crowd of crew whom I will get to know over the next two months. Introduce myself. Leading lady and director are loggerheading. Makeup man and hair lady are sniping. Meanwhile, I am gearing myself up to say with a straight face and Scots accent, Damned be these hell-besmeared and black satanic farting holes. 9th of February. I cannot believe I am not in London for the premiere of Withnell and I. Spend the day raging around like my limbs were amputated. After all this time, and here I am in ice-cold Boston. Bugger. Appointment to meet photographer supremo Richard Avedon in his studio. 65 going on 25 with extraordinary eyes and charm by the carrot load. I'm photographed and then videotaped improvising stuff for a Calvin Klein commercial. Love talk. Just for the experience. I kid myself. 15th of February. Get back to L.A. and the makeup man is fired. They reckon the cheek shading on my face looks like mud. Claims he will sue. More withnail cuttings are coming through and it's strange to read so many reviews that fixate on my physiognomy. Tombstone featured. Sepulchral, lantern-jawed, pop-eyed, acres of forehead, slow of eye, slab-faced. It's sort of like an undertaker's catalogue. We travel out to the Mojave Desert and put up in a motel on the highway that is pure Paris, Texas, down to the flies and sullen staff. We are shooting a Victorian farmhouse, and I'm required to do part of a stunt with my whip, trapping Julian round the ankles and then falling. We're three floors up on the turret of the house. The stuntman then does the full fall, and I cannot believe that this human being was going to go through with a three-story drop. Insane. But he does, and has to be carted off on a stretcher as he has cracked his shoulder. After which, trying to control the flighty warlock with my whip, I am dragged forwards, holding the whip attached to a crane, through a field of fake cabbages, like water skiing on the ground, then thumping into a barn door. My supreme bravery earns me huge respect from the mustachioed macho crew. You're not a method actor, are you? And this clearly a compliment. 22nd of February. It seems that due to a failure by Bruce Robinson's producer and my agent to inform and or negotiate with one another, my filming schedule for Warlock makes me unavailable to do How to Get Ahead in Advertising, Bruce's Boyle film. The mix-up is due to the ever-changing start dates for shooting advertising, which finally got the go-ahead once Withnail opened so well in London. Betrayal of trust, selling out to Hollywood. These and any other insult that fits are bandied across the Atlantic by the parties involved, while I sit in my hotel room shaking my head in disbelief that this role and my friendship with its creator have gone belly up. I can't bear to accept that Bruce has written me off and offered the part to somebody else, and worse still, that our friendship has been jettisoned in the process. What did I do? Begged.
and after more toing and froing, an attack and counterattack, a rapprochement is brought about by the producer who acts as intermediary and calms both sides. Before my warlock hunting is over, the deal is done for me to play the lead, Bagley, an ad man who grows a talking carbuncle on his neck. I never want another week like that, never want to be trapped to the bedhead and the footrail and pulled in opposite directions, unable to speak for the sheer anxiety and frustration of it. Suffice to say that this was the beginning of the end of my relationship with Michael Whitehall. 10th of June. Joan is pregnant. We bow our heads, hold tight, and hope. 4th of January, 1989. After three months in hospital, with complications, Joan gives birth to our daughter Olivia, one month premature, a little bird, alive. Oh God, oh God, oh God. 5th of May, 32 years old today. Finally leave Michael Whitehall Limited and join the ICM agency under the guidance of another Michael, this one a foster, to be known affectionately hereafter as the Dwarf. Sincerely hope this is it and that I never have to go through another agent changeover. 6th of June, Henry and June. I'm summoned to the Portobello Hotel to meet director Philip Kaufman, he of the right stuff and the unbearable lightness of being repute. He's now casting a film about Henry Miller and Anais Nin. So excited you could come and meet with us. My wife Rose and I loved your work in With Nail and I. So funny. Thank you. I blubbed the right stuff, I reply. We love each other up a bit before he gets down to discussing the character he has in mind for me. We're looking for a James Stewart kind of a guy. Sweet, uncynical, pure, faithful, and straight as an arrow. All of which you will appreciate. I have become as each adjective has spooled forth. Now the thing is, this character, Hugo Guiller, the husband of Anis Nin, must be played by a strong actor, although, to be honest, he is the weak character and cuckold of the piece. Have you read any of Miller or Nin? This is the moment when you really have to act and try to lie convincingly that of course you are au fait with much of the collected canon when Tropic of Cancer is as far as you got in your late teens. Phil tells me with a totally straight face that Hugo had a famously large penis. I suppress a chortle and only manage to half listen to his analysis of why Anais might have strayed into a relationship with Henry and June. By the end of the conversation, I swear my member has grown to such a length that a small barrow might be in order to wheel it out. The dwarf is on the phone. Alec Baldwin as Henry, Uma Thurman as June, Maria de Medaros as Anais, and Richard E. Grant as Hugo. Universal Pictures are producing and they hope to go in early August. Money is... yippy time. I'm now reading everything ever written by Miller and Nin, which is a lot. The opportunity to recreate their lives in milieu galvanizes every minute, and even though I'm not playing Miller, reading his and Nin's correspondence has become somehow personal. The wonderful illusion that good writing induces is the belief that were you around with them then, you would have been one of them, and or definitely best friends. I scour the photographs knowing that I'm playing a real person for clues, get the magnifier out and scrutinize Hugo's pants for signs of endowment. No visible trace. 17th of August. Major Wobble. Alex Baldwin has withdrawn two weeks prior to shooting. Who will play Miller? Suggestions and possibilities are flung around like so much confetti, and Fred Ward, one of the astronauts in The Right Stuff, is tracked down and cast. 22nd of August. Leaving London. Olivia is seven months old, and this will be my first time away. What should be love-crowned prior to the departure is rather nerve-ridden and tetchy. 23rd of August, Paris. Rehearsal Day 1. Maria de Medairoche and I take part in a sexual chemistry test, presided over by Phil Kaufman, who adjudicates our every mutual reaction. Maria is an identicate of the real Nin, and we tell one another how like the real people we look. When do we do our bed scenes? she asks, wide-eyed and beguiling and ironic and teasing, and peels off a fruity laugh. You're just perfect, is what comes out of my mouth, her temperamental forecast and all clear. We ping-pong anecdotals at each other and skirt round one another's private lives. Do you live alone? More laughter. You English, I'm in love but not married, and maybe with two people. You are Anaïs. Relief is evident all round that this casting duet is a match. 
wonder at the nerve rack experienced by a director who, in addition to a multitude of technical demands and production pressures, has the risk of thesp personalities not gelling. American actor Kevin Spacey bounds in as Maria beams out. He plays Miller's best friend, an unsuccessful writer who constantly claims that he has actually written or at least inspired Henry's work. Fred Ward playing Miller is in next, silent and contained as muscles. The final member of the quartet is Uma Thurman, whom I meet in the hairdressers, where she's having hair and makeup tests while an electric buzzard denudes my head in about five seconds flat. Uma is 19, tall forever, and painted to look like Marlene Dietrich, which gives her cause for complaint. It looks like a mask. This induces a flurry of activity and fast French from the team of chain smokers who hover, prod, and paint. Everyone is decked top to toe in leather and chains, and you could be fooled that this is some sort of biker's convention. We trade family history a while, and I realized I'd been earning a living of sorts for ten years, which constituted half of her life. Wondered whether she thought of me as some kind of pre galapagian tortoise lumbering towards the Middle Ages. Probably. Around my late teens, I used to think thirty pretty advanced and decrepit. We are invited to have lunch with Phil and his son, Peter Kaufman, and the topic is resolutely sexual. They are a sort of double act, with uncannily similar voices, and assert that all of Paris is bisexual, and that they frown on condoms. Rose Kaufman arrives, having been scouting for objets d'art for the Nin interiors. She wears little makeup, flowing ethnic Indian clothing and beads, and exudes an air of Buddhist calm, along with a quietly expressed passion for Miller and Nin. Rose speaks quietly and sets out to reassure me that although my character is the obvious outsider, cuckold and dullard of the quartet, it is incredibly significant and important. With this placebo and pity for downed, we are all disbanded to meet again for the read-through a couple of days hence. 24th of August. Instead of two free days being a tally-ho into the streets and museums and life of Paris, I am immobilized, paralyzed from the waist down, by the fear. Maybe, maybe there's just too much art out there. Nouveau, Rococo, Richelieu, and Betomouche, Gogo, Disco, and Can Can. What has specifically precipitated this crisis is having heard my tape recorded attempt at an American accent. The read through of the script with real Americans sends the prospect of firings and retirings rattling around my head. Resolved to search for the phone next to the bed and ask for help. Cindy Huppala, the American dialect coach on call to perfect Uma's Bronx accent, obliges my panic stricken request and sets up an appointment. 28th of August, Epinay Studios pre shoot finals. Chaos with a big cha cha. Getting this whole shebang up and shooting has everyone on red alert. Costume department is stricken with stitching, seaming and fitting up to try to make it in time. Hair and makeup tests are still going escargot slow and the lighting fiddlebouts are painstaking. Hot and humid as a hippo's rectum, I'm trussed up in a three-piece tweed suit with overcoat and tweed hat, choking on a pipe for a camera test. Sars hair and wearing this tall domed hat, my reflection is that of an extra-long condom. I'm seriously considering asking Philip Rousselot, the cinematographer, to use a cinemascope lens to widen things out a bit. Ponder a head-widening contractual stipulation when hair is shorn for period part purposes. Uma is no no knowing all attempts to cut a little more from her bangs. She is sheathed in a satin skin dress and is about to shoot a clip for a film within the film sequence, a replica of Hedy Lamar's film Ecstasy, which word best described the faces of the assembled crew on seeing Miss Thurman's entrance. Murmurs of Venus, a part she has already played in Baron Munchausen. The first day scheduled is a scene between Maria and me, which we rehearse with Phil before the end of the day. This marriage is like a pot of boiling water. Monday, on the first day of shooting, will be the first time to put in the spaghetti. Hopefully, sourced by an authentic Yank accent. Invited that night to dinner with Jean-Philippe Ecoffet and company. He is playing the bisexual dance teacher who also doodles with the ubiquitous Miss Nin. Someone called Belinda joins our table and declares she is in the middle of a nervous breakdown, hence her constant toing and froing from the phone. Although she doesn't know Gary Oldman or Uma Thurman, she asserts that they are an item. I feel topsy-turvid, because I did a television film with Gary a couple of years back, and we both got married and had children at about the same time, barely seven months ago. I don't remember the rest of the dinner, capsized by this upheaval. Any split is a raw reminder of my parents' divorce when I was eleven, 
and playing this cuckolded man and then hearing this news is a painful jolt. The first day of shooting is at a replica of the Nin House in the suburb of Lucienne. A huge marquee has been erected and a five-course lunch with wine is on offer. I've never seen catering on a film anything like this before. There's not a single baked bean or battered cod in sight. The scheduling allows for slow entry. The first scenes simply require entering the front door, running up the stairs. But overhanging all this is the last scene of the day, which is a spat, pivotal to the breakdown of the marriage, all of which has to be conveyed in about ten sentences, none of which seems possible at this pre-feast distance, when we are all still relative strangers. Fortunately, the combination of costume and three-dimensional sets, the real house, painted to fill specifications, and all the background reading swirling about the cranium, converges so that something clicks. And whereas before lunch all seems chaotic and uncontrolled, come the moment to start, excitement and adrenaline have replaced the jitterbugs. Phil offers a key to the scene. I want no outward show of hysteria or snotty pleadings. All is repressed. This is the moment when all your personal betrayals and demons are called upon to transmit into lines written by someone else. The setup is an absurdity. Thirty-five strangers are crammed on a landing outside a closed door with lights, mics, cameras, cables and inconvenience focused on one actor having an argument about infidelity with an actress who is on the other side of the door, alone yet surrounded. Phil says, Action! and your head feels hot, and the reality of the situation suddenly overwhelms you, and the thirty-five pairs of eyes become background, invisible. And a sound comes from your throat that sounds like someone else. And seemingly without thinking, just feeling, you are, at that moment, a man arguing with his wife about his suspected affair with a best friend. And it is painful. And it's just acting. Cut is called, and in the few seconds of silence... Nobody looks anyone in the eye, or so it seems, and you feel something has happened. The sense that you have done it is momentarily satisfying, yet it also feels as if it's somehow out there and not really to do with yourself at all. Perhaps this is what those tomes mean when they talk about actors as vessels, conduits, and every other variant of conductor. I have a revelation of sorts on the car journey home. In costume and shorn haircut, I look very like my father did when he was my age, and he was cuckolded much like Hugo was. I realize that this connection is what I have been seeking, and once experienced, I feel I know how and why Hugo is what he is. I re-examine the photographs and swear I recognize the look in his eyes, tight-lipped, set-jawed, smiling, gentle, and betrayed. 6th of September, night shoot. Uma Thurman begins filming. Her entrada happens at night. She appears out of the mist and enters the Nin household for her first dinner with Anais, Henry and Hugo. The rehearsal for camera and crew takes place in the early evening, and Uma is wearing leggings and a shapeless oversized sweater, hair in a bundle and not a scrap of makeup. She walks back and forth so that the crew can work out how much camera track to lay and where the smoke machine should be set up. Later, once the shot is set up, Uma emerges again from her caravan, as though she had just burst out of her chrysalis. Such is the transformation. At something around six foot tall in heels, hair coiled and waved close to her head, vamp makeup with blood-red lips, and body poured into a sheath of black satin, she is nothing short of a Venus Coca-Cola bottle. Such is the potent effect of her silent entrance that you can hear the collective jaw-drop of the cast and crew, fifty of them. Curiously, now that Uma is all done up, she is treated completely differently. Her beauty and its effect translates into a flurry of activity all around her, as though everyone has to be careful not to knock into, bump or break her. The combination of genetic engineering and makeup and wardrobing pronounces outward perfection, which probably has nothing to do with how she really feels. Notice her hand shaking as she gropes for a cigarette. You look like a million bucks, Uma. Your accent is sounding good, Rich. Fair trade. Watching her enter from the dark and slinking towards the lit house is as potent a delight as my first ever sighting of Munro sidestepping the steam in Some Like It Hot. There is general disbelief that she is only nineteen, so apparently self-possessed. I looked round to see what effect she had wrought upon Phil and Rose. They have megavolt smiles on their faces. 7th of September. 
Not call the next day. Chronic flu has gripped my lungs overnight. It's pouring and Paris is all moody and misty grey. Having a day off should be a bonus, yet the reason for being here is to film, and doing that is so all-embracing and involving that come the day you don't work, there's this terrible void. 8th of September. Friday is a good one, the chief pleasure being the ease with which Maria and I work together. Huge, owl-like eyes, and endless patience, and delight in playing this role. I get to fuck everyone in this picture, she giggles. My frustration derives from the impotence of the character I'm playing. Hugo is so back-footed, and it's a challenge to suppress the impetus to drive the scenes along. Passivity is not one of my attributes. 12th of September. It's a smoky autumn day, but still swanny warm. Hear a load of swoon and gush from Rose and Phil about how marvellous the rushes are, and it's all woodland dappled light and impressionist visuals and the four central characters riding bicycles and much bonjour and bonhomie. I peek in to see Uma, where she is in the middle of hitching on a headscarf and plonk myself down. "'How's your love life, kiddo?' blurts out. "'Just dandy, daddy-o,' she retorts. "'I confess I know who it is.' "'And she says she thought so, "'but wasn't sure whether to ask, "'and there's just relief that it is out there. "'She unravels the story of their courtship, "'and I am schizoided by her joy and passion "'in contrast to the pain and sadness "'that must be suffered by Leslie, Gary's wife. "'The instinct squirrels around inside, "'wishing it could make good somehow.' but the rational knows that what is broke is not mendable. 2nd of October. We have three night shoots scheduled. For this, read late afternoon arrival and get to bed after dawn. The scenes are a recreation of the legendary arts carnival held in the streets of Paris by students and bohemians in the 20s and early 30s. From the photographic evidence, it looked like a fantastic excuse to get stark bollock naked, paint yourself blue and gold, get drunk, and fuck as many people as you liked, all in the spirit of ancient bacchanalia. Except it's October, and it's freezing. Wine is provided in large quantities, as much to get everyone into the spirit of midsummer madness as to combat the freeze that is about to assault the collective unguarded and exposed gonads. The wardrobe department has aluminium blankets at the ready for between take times, as there is not enough indoor shelter to cope with the vast numbers. People queue up to be painted and powdered by the fraught overworked makeup department, who have had to requisition distant relatives and anyone who can wield a sponge to get everyone painted up in time. The wardrobe mistress has taken pity upon my scarecrow physique and has given me a minute penis pouch with a string at the bum like a go go dancer. My flesh is pale blue before the makeup and is goose bumping all over. Within a short space of time, everyone is arseholed, and rudimentary loin cover has been forsaken for full frontal assault and dangle. Swinging genitalia and mammaries painted blue and gold exert a hypnotic fascination for the first three hours, after which curiosity palls, until a faction of revellers engage in drunken coitals. We are now having a good chortle at an extra leaning against a wall, who is inspecting his blue erection with all the wide-eyed wonderment of a lunar scientist. The crew are duffel-coated, and for once the smoke coming from their mouths isn't Golwar's but arctic breath. Between takes, the wardrobe assistants rush forth with aluminium sheets, and there follows a strained crackling sound like giant sweet wrappers uncrinkling in a small cinema as each extra is foiled. Gold heads and blue feet either end of the silver. 10th of October. With a few days free from shooting State of Grace in New York, Gary Oldman concords into town to see Uma. Hello, my darling as insouciant and charming as ever. State of disgrace, if you ask me, is what jumps out of my mouth, and the expected thin ice of unease is broken by unexpected laughter, relief of sorts, but guilt-edged. What do you think of Uma, then? He is full of falling in love, fired with his new life in America, and is soon off and running through uncanny impersonations of Sean Penn, De Niro, Brando, and Ian McKellen, from which he seamlessly transfers into a lisping, campy South London monologue about why he just had to give up living in London, because it just got so fucking boring. Do you know what I mean, love? Sashaying off down the corridor in caricature, before turning round and giggling back as Gary. There is no doubting that he's an acting magician and I am charmed from any vestige of Jacques. 13th of November. Paris by night. Brassai's photographs of the Parisian demi-monde, which are displayed in every poster and postcard store, are the inspiration for the brothel and dance hall scenes. The casting director has chosen lookalikes, 
And it's a bizarre déjà vu to find these black and white images given flesh and blood, reality, and color. My discomfort comes from being fully decked out in black tie, standing among these extras, playing ladies of the night, all of whom are starkers, middle-aged, and tending towards the Rubenesque. Although I am assured these people have come out of their own volition and are getting paid, I feel ashamed. The scene involves Anais requesting a sexual exhibition from the madame. She is offered a choice of the prostitutes and opts for a June and Anais pair of clones. After half a day, I did manage some chat, although strong eye contact was maintained throughout, lest mine absent-mindedly strayed and ended up staring at someone's minge. 14th of November. Ralph Brown, the actor who played the epochal drug dealer in Withnow, calls to make dinner plans. He is in Paris for the filming of Impromptu, a biopic about the life of Chopin, starring Hugh Grant as the famous piano-thumping coffer, opposite Judy Davis as Georges Sand. We meet up in some seafood brasserie, and I discover that Hugh's girlfriend is Elizabeth Hurley, with whom I had done a Schweppes advert a couple of years back. She was a Munro blonde back then, and has transformed into a brunette siren, wearing a micro miniskirt, which she deliriously disports before the goggle-eyed punters every time she cruises off to the ladies. She and Hugh are like gorgeous siblings, both speaking in accents that sound like old BBC recordings from the fifties, tossing their voluminous manes of hair about and being as funny and provocative about everything as they dare. Hugh orders a vast platter of oysters, which provides the cue for talk about aphrodisiacs. It's impossible to take anything he says seriously, as everything is ironized. He fires off with, Do you like anal sex? I bet you do. You have that look about you. You must be telepathic, I reply, trying not to choke on the poised oyster. I can spot an ex-public schoolboy from a mile off. Bum, bum and buggery. You must be ever so rich. Rolling, Hugh. Rolling. Little bastard. Must be marvellous to be as rich and famous as you are. <laughs> I wish. Don't pretend to be modest with me. You are rich, aren't you? Out with it. Loaded. Bastard. Hugh, do you ever talk and say what you mean at the same time? Inquires Ralph. Of course not, you stupid, ignorant, working-class person. Hugh manages the precarious feat of insulting you up, down and sideways without your wanting to lay his dentals on a platter. I hate you, always getting these jammy jobs, getting even more famous and with the same surname. I've got better hair, though. Did you want to sleep with Elizabeth when you did that appalling advert together? I should jolly well hope so. How can you even ask? Of course yes. Well, I'm sure she wouldn't mind. Things are sounding increasingly like a skewed version of the famous five round here. Everything seems to revolve around the reproductive act, and I wonder if it's Paris that elicits this response, or whether the subconscious is at fever pitch with the goings-on in Henry and June. L.A. Story Rewind to 16th of April, 1989. Lumiere Cinema in St. Martin's Lane, Sunday morning, cast and crew screening of How to Get Ahead in Advertising. Something unnatural about seeing a film so early in the day, with everyone standing about afterwards like loose farts, as though they're waiting for something else to happen. But what does happen next is a sidewinder. An American man with silver-gray hair, baseball cap, and a strong handshake is saying, Hi, I'm Steve Martin. This is my wife Victoria, and I just want to tell you we thought you were great. Shiver me old timbers, but it's the wild and crazy guy himself. How come you're here? Trills from my tonsils. We're friends of Bruce and Sophie Robinson, and he invited us. We loved with Nail. If you're uh, interested, I've uh, written a script called L.A. Story that has a part you might want to do. If it happens, not the lead role, wrote that for myself. Fast forward, 14th of March, 1990. I get the call from the coast. L.A. Story has been greenlit and is a go project. 26th of April. Flight to Los Angeles. A medium-sized limo hauls my tired olds to the Chateau Marmot Hotel on Sunset Boulevard, and the driver takes this as his cue to give me a rundown of everyone who's died in the joint, from Belushi backwards. 28th of April. I'm woken by a call from Victoria Tennant. Welcome to L.A. Steve and I were wondering if you had already made lunch plans. Come by around 12.30 and bring swimming trunks. See you later. Swimming trunks has a sort of Julie Andrews commanding tone to it, friendly but forthright. It's only when I press the button in the convertible to get the sunroof retracted and take a right onto Sunset Boulevard that my old ticker accelerates faster than my foot. Sun blazing down, music kiss heffeming, and the red car is nosing towards Beverly Hills. A moment to check out my sunglassed reflection at the traffic lights. Yes, it is you, tomb features. Enjoy this moment, because chances are reality will nosedive in soon enough. A totally anonymous, handleless door is spied upon by a recessed camera from above. Press buzzer and wait. 
Door swivels open on a huge hinge like a hospital ward door, and it's Steve and Casual saying, Come on in. Do you want a glass of aqua libra? Victoria is equally welcoming, dressed all in black with straight blonde hair chopped at the shoulders, no jewelry, and a skim of makeup. Let me show you some art, says Steve. I collect. The interior is all white and open plan, with a long corridor and adjoining rooms, skylit like a private gallery. Bach chamber music wherever you go, controlled from a central panel that regulates the light, air, and sound. Smell of freshly baking bread coming from an individual bread-making machine. And walls of serious art. These are the big boys of American abstract expressionism, and I am drop-jawed at seeing them in a private house rather than in a gallery or book. Being in this house is like being in a Hockney painting, everything clear-lined and California-coloured. Like the paintings, whose images are so familiar, Steve's face is equally so. Yet here he is, unscripted and live, and it is taking some self-control not to tour his features like that inquisitive pop-eyed professor from Tintin. We're so thrilled that you are able to do this movie. <laughs> Believe me, the thrill's all mine. His gush at me short-circuits my gush at him, which means that we are able to begin a conversation that has been depth-charged free of all flattery. Victoria has barbecued up lunch, and we managed to yak away some hours without the dreaded iceberg long hours that I had been warned might occur. Before long, we're exchanging nicknames. I'm given the title of Relentless. Steve chats away all the preconceptions I have been fed, and I'm quietly relieved not to have made a complete goomba of myself. 29th of April. Continuing where we left off, Steve gives an impromptu cabaret, which is a licorice all sorts of his philosophy, ranging from self-deprecation to wildly bombastic mockeries interspersed with musical numbers. He's a brilliant banjo player. It strikes me as the perfect instrument for him, as its playing style requires the restlessness that seems to course through his veins, in contrast to Victoria's aura of maintained calm and control. We eat outside beside the narrow lap pool, painted black to retain the heat. Overwhelming perfume from the massed jasmine creepers. Delicious. Christie's is having an exhibition at the Beverly Hills Hotel today. Want to take a walk over and look? A walk in Beverly Hills is an unusual prospect. The only non-motorized human sightings so far are restricted to Mexican gardeners. The three of us set out. We cross Sunset Boulevard, and it seems incredibly wide and dangerous compared to the air-conditioned calm of a convertible. Once inside the hotel, you could be forgiven for mistaking the exhibition as a gathering of friends of Nebuchadnezzar, such as the vintage of the patrons. The ancients are more fascinating than the art. In the midst of this, I am introduced to Marcia Weissman, doyen of art collectors still recognizable from the vast portrait Hockney did of her in 1968, titled American Collectors, although she is not in the fluorescent pink caftan that my memory expects her to be wearing 22 years later. The prices quoted for each painting are in mega multiples of naught, and for a couple of seconds I can feel my head nodding and bobbing, as if I might just be considering the possibility. But I content myself instead with computing the combined ages of the assembled warthogs. We finally escape to the terrace, and my tongue lashing its way round the wrinkled contents of the just-vacated pharaoh's tomb gets a laugh from my hosts, which dispels any vestige of formal awe I might have clung to over the past two days. They mutually conclude that I am missing that cranial organ which censors thought before it hurtles out of my mouth, no doubt confirming my relentlessnessness. My only consolation is the sense that being yourself is somehow welcome in a city where bullshit has been elevated into an art form. I ask Steve if we can go through his script together, to which he readily agrees, making alterations and adjustments then and there to some of my dialogue. It's up to you to make something of this part, because it doesn't exactly jump off the page, so you'll just have to act it. He booms, widening his eyes like he's in a silent movie. All this bonding will no doubt help when it comes to playing Roland, the whelp, who is his real wife's real-life husband in the film. Am I to be forever cast as the cuckold in American films? 30th of April. Costume fittings, hair and makeup lookover. The clothes are Brits abroad. Ralph Lauren flannel pants and striped shirts, and the ubiquitous baggy khaki shorts, guaranteed to render most legs like a Spike Milligan cartoon. The hair person pulls her hands through my wig and declares, Let's just leave it as it is, cause there's no way I could make it look any dumber, right? You are playing the geeky husband, right? Right. This character assessment is oddly reassuring in its uninvited abruptness in total contrast to what an agent or director might have to say, feeling it incumbent upon themselves to shuffle around what the part actually is, a geek. I like it. 
Start shooting in a couple of days' time. 3rd of May. Ambassador Hotel in Midtown, L.A. This is the joint where, in 1969, Bobby Kennedy was shot in the kitchens, after he had just made a speech. The hotel never recovered from the shame and closed down. Now it's an ad hoc studio, cheaper than a real studio, hence its popularity. There are four other films being shot here at the same time, one of which is written by Neil Simon and stars Alec Baldwin and Kim Basinger. Mr. Simon is a friend of Steve's, and we all have lunch together. He looks just like Kermit the Frog, but with huge owl specks and an incredibly thick New York accent, just like Eugene in his own Brighton Beach Memoirs play. We are shooting the big L.A. lunch scene, which is interrupted by an earthquake amid people getting their orders in for coffees of every denomination, from nuclear caffeinated to DDDDD detonated mud. It is Victoria's first entrance in the film. We are all seated at a large round table, peopled with actors playing a variety of L.A. types including three stand-up comics, which means that they seem impelled to do their routines at Steve and the rest of us whenever they have the chance. The setup is taking time, as it's a huge area to light and dress with props and people. There are life-sized swans sculpted out of ice, foliage and fruit to arrange, circular camera tracks to be laid and rehearsed for focusing around the central table, microphones to be hidden in flowers and up the insides of our clothes, hair to be boofed and faces to be tanned. Special effects boys are playing with the rigging and pulleys to affect the earthquake interruption, to which no one will pay any attention in the scene. That's the joke. I am seated next to Iman, the staggeringly beautiful Somalian ex-supermodel turned actress. She tells how she was spotted by a talent scout while still a university student in the streets of Nairobi and transformed into a catwalk queen. Meet Marilu Hanna, whom I recognize from Taxi. She's playing Steve's bitchy girlfriend. Marilou is like Shirley MacLaine on speed, tinkly laugh, and talks her whole family history out, how she grew up in a vast household filled with kids, and how they put on their own shows and had their own football team, and how her burgeoning career in show business was every dream she ever dreamt of coming true. Steve is self-deprecating about his writing, and invites people to improvise dialogue around the table, which everyone does. The Americans have a stunning absence of any timidity, and throw themselves into improvising without so much as a flicker of self-doubt which I find wholly liberating and welcome. 11th of May. I've noticed something that escaped me on my first film out here, how the exact same conversational weight is given to talk about one's nutritionist, masseur, publicist, manager, agent, favorite eatery, and Gorby's current invasion of Lithuania. Do you think there is a movie in there? History is mere fodder for the next picture pitch, and current affairs mean which famous person is fucking which other famous person. But then I suppose this is hardly surprising in a town where there's such a concentration of self-obsessed thespia. Knowing everybody's business is the business. Within this cosmos, rumour is able to run rampant like a computer virus. A current story that has achieved mythic proportions, aided by the wealth of new technology, fax, mobile phones, laser copiers, email, and of course plain old-fashioned grapevining, concerns a globally famous film star known for his sexual presence and the gerbil. The claim goes that this star had to be admitted to the Cedar sinai Hospital to have a gerbil removed from his bum. Every crew member at some point has tried out the latest jokes and variations on this theme since I got here. There are cartoons in magazines and papers, asides on late-night chat shows, comic riffs from stand-up comedians. Even my writing about it, with a thank God it's not me on my horizon, is perpetuating it. Poor sod. 13th of May social Sunday. Picked up Fiona Shaw. She is here shooting three men and a little lady, about which she says, I play a Joyce Grenfellish spinster with lustful intentions towards Ted Danson, her groan of embarrassment accompanied by sideways head shakes. We have been invited to lunch with a producer for whom we both worked on Mountains of the Moon, a historical epic about Burton and Speak searching for the source of the Nile, which sadly took a deep bath, as they say, at the box office. Fiona's performance, however, prompted various American critics to hail her as the next Meryl Streep, and she's understandably smarting at having to resort to playing a goofball in the Three Men and a Baby sequel. I accelerate onto Santa Monica Boulevard and vroom up towards her hotel, where we are due to pick up Sheila Hancock, who is also playing a part in the Baby sequel. While we're waiting in the foyer, we meet Dennis Lawson just checking out. He's been out here at Disney's expense to screen test for the pilot of the TV series of Dead Poets Society, but is being Scottishly sceptical of his chances. It feels very unreal meeting Brit actors amid all this sunny deluxe, a whole continental remove from the reality of duffel-coated rehearsal rooms and styrofoam cups in dark corners of London. Sheila finally appears from her delayed phone call, and the three of us roar off to lunch. 
Welcome, come on in. It's our trusty host, sporting all his teeth with alligator charm. He's wearing a white silk shirt that floats and shifts like a balletic tent round his ample girth. While well, you have to drink, we move through, accompanied by a soft wall of Mozart, flowers, potpourri, and penguin-suited waiters proffering drinks, and canapes laid out on large palm-leaved platters. The high walls are covered with vast abstract canvases and huge African masks, lit by the sloping skylights. The black bottom pool and the jacuzzi is part indoors, partly in the garden, divided by enormously tall sliding glass panels. All in all, it's like being in a pristine set of carnal knowledge, 1970. I know how curious you are. Come and take a look at this. I find myself in the strange position of a guided tour in my host's bedroom. He points out the control panel beside the bed. It looks like a miniature lighting keyboard for a reasonably sized repertory theater, all black and shiny like almost everything else in the room. Phone, intercom, music control dials, air conditioning, levitating television screen, electric window blinds, and press that button. I do, and there's a faint whirring noise which gets louder as a slightly shaky black ice bucket holding a bottle of champagne swivels up from a mini trapdoor on the floor, like that hand holding the sword that comes out of the lake in King Arthur. Neat, huh? Gets the ladies every time. I dare not think how many ladies have been buttoned by this James Bond gadgetry, and wonder if any of them have ever swapped notes. Needs oiling. I collect art. Gets us out of the boudoir and back into the throng. I'd like you to meet. And here, amongst others, is Richard Dreyfus talking at rocket speed about the lack of government funding for AIDS research, Neil Simon and his new wife, a man who wrote speeches for Kennedy, and Carrie Fisher. Lunch is served at three tables on the terrace, with people butterflying between, and is a sumptuous feast of Thai Californian. Carrie is asking questions fast. What she really wants to know is what I think of Hollywood. Not the place, but the state of mind. I begin with that swivelling, levitating ice bucket in the black bedroom. She is so fast, funny, and ruthlessly self-deprecating that I wonder aloud how she has survived. Because I'm fast, funny, and ruthlessly self-obsessing. Look, I haven't. The news obviously hasn't reached your neck of the woods. Don't be daft. Postcards from the Edge was brilliant. Thanks. Writing has saved my ass. I see you're married. Are you in love? That's my question. I got in first. Are you? Yes. Lucky you. Kids? One. Baby daughter. Tell me about the birth part. And within a few sentences, I find myself detailing the nightmare we went through, as if I have known her all my life. I suppose her having exposed her soul in postcards goes some way to explaining why this should have tripped out so trippingly, rendering a public function into a private place. Her conversation is a beguiling mix of anecdote, irony, unexpected vulnerability, and straight-down-the-line jokes. Fiona and Sheila are signalling for an imminent departure. Fiona is doing gasping acting, saying she needs some air, says she finds the whole thing nothing short of sinister, and accuses me with, I notice what a tough time you were having in it, you wretched socialiser. 23rd of May, last day of filming, and the panic of the bubble of it all about to burst combines with a longed-for return to my family on the other side of the planet. 26th of May, jet-lagged and tentative, these first few days are spent trying not to infringe on the independent territory remapped out by my patient spouse during my five-week absence. Baby wakes at 2 a.m. and is teething. Still jet-lagged, I stupidly complain the next morning about feeling exhausted and unleash you think you're exhausted, and the inevitable domestic explosion that follows with a dose of don't touch me, and a half day of brimstone and glaring eyeballs in every direction, after which all is levelled off and loved up. Hudson Hawk. Oh, my sweet darlings, where, oh, where do I dare begin to tell this multi-million dollar epic, which, as defined by the Oxford Dictionary, means a long poem in elevated style narrating the adventures of a hero, long novel or film, one containing adventurous episodes, heroic, majestic, impressively great. Hudson Hawk is all of these, but not quite in the order suggested. Long, certainly. Heroic, Oh, yes, but not quite what you might have in mind. The patience required would sorely test the most Olympian devotees of Prozac. Majestic? The mega-budget spirals like new stairways to heaven. Adventurous? With a cast including Bruce Willis, Annie McDowell, Danny Aiello, James Coburn, Sandra Bernhardt and myself, what else? 21st of March, 1990. 
My agent, he of the aforementioned dwarfish stature, announces that an American casting director, Jackie Birch, requires me to meet at the Athenaeum Hotel in Piccadilly, London, with the director of Hudson Hawk, a big-budget action comedy which is to star Bruce Willis. The script is being messengered to my abode as we speak, he says. It is, and it reads fast and funny. 22nd of March. 7.45 p.m. assignation at the Athenaeum. Michael Lehman, the director of Heathers, is helming this biggie. I scan the elderly clientele, getting their coats on to cab off to see Phantom of the Opera, mostly rich Americans perfumed up for a night of Lloyd Webber Coliseum spectacle. Ping! And this time, the elevator disgorges two straggly-looking students in the wake of the Fur Coat Brigade. Just as I am about to blip them out, the shorter one beams... Hi, so great to meet you. I'm Michael Lehman, and this is Dan Waters, the writer. We did Heathers together. Let's go sit down and get a drink. We do, and they really do look like undergraduates. I feel overdressed and overaged. They are not yet thirty. Michael and Dan do a double-act description of their script, which they characterize as a tongue-in-cheek Bond film. It'll be kind of fun, because Bond is already a sort of parody, which we are double-parodying. The story is the dream of Bruce Willis, who has nurtured it since his days of being a New York barman before his career took off with moonlighting on television and went ballistic with his movie role in Die Hard 1 and Die Hard 2. Joel Silver produced both and is repeating the same duties on Hudson Hawk. We think you might be just kind of perfect for the part of the villain in this, kind of like all the Bond Blofelds rolled in one, and mescaline. 5th of April Two weeks have elapsed, and today the dwarf calls to say I may have to fly to New York to meet Messrs. Willis and Silver. In the interim fortnight, a friend is diagnosed with a terminal brain tumour, and there is a very emotional memorial for Ian Charson, all of which puts this hanging about into proper perspective. 12th of April. I receive a call that is an offer without having to fly to New York or any such. 28th of June. Get a call to fly to L.A. for a read-through. L.A. I touch down and am limoed up into the Hollywood Hills to Greg Gorman's photographic studio, where I meet Sandra Bernhardt for the first time, as well as Mickey Rourke, who is tinkering with his bike. He looks like Mickey Rourke in costume, for he's decked up in the full biker gear, with snakeskin cowboy boots, shades, scowl, and pirate-style headscarf, fag in the right corner, and sliver of lip space for words to mumble out. Movie star via Marlboro Man tough, clanking, and undeniably comical to these jet-lagged eyes. Meet Marushka Detmers, the Dutch actress playing the female lead. Sandra Bernhardt, who plays my wife, is having her makeup applied when we meet and is about to be transformed into something awesome. Her auburn hair has been teased up into a frenzy until it resembles one of those ice cream whirls that whip out of a machine onto a cone. Her eyes crane to their right corners as she cannot turn her head just yet, and she twangs. Hi, honey. She has an instantly discernible trademark sigh, which insinuates itself through her speech and loping walk, as if everything is slightly exhausting and demanding. She takes everything personally, and while professing to loathe the whole Hollywood thing, I do not doubt for a moment that she is reveling amid her own moanings. She is perfect casting to play Minerva Mayflower, the world's richest, most evil bitch villainess. Greg Gorman's studio is also his house, which is all white and glass and light and music playing. Marilyn, the costume designer, kits me out in the Chiruti gear, and Greg snaps and lights and polaroids and relights and confers and makes the whole process seem easy. These pictures are for a faux Vanity Fair star cover for a scene in the film. Added to which, our dog is included. It is a terrier, a white and tan, rough-haired, box-faced canine that looks like an Edwardian toy, the kind that has straight legs and is mounted on a platform with wheels and a handlebar. We pose with the imagined arrogance of the world's richest couple, with Sandra doing a Nirvana Trump monologue during the snapping. 29th of June, 9 a.m., read through at Warner Brothers Studio. Met Albert Brooks on the way in. Liked your boil. Thanks. Liked your broadcast news. Thanks. Cheers. The casual, sunny, open-plan atmosphere makes it hard to believe anyone really has a proper job. Everyone looks and seems dressed for a summer holiday. Read in requested text and drawl. By mid-morning, this request is withdrawn, and why not try it in like a snotty British accent? Done. 4 p.m. to Paramount Studios to meet Bruce Willis and Joel Silver. It's Bruce's last day on Bonfire of the Vanities. Filming is mid-setup, and when we find Bruce, he disarms me with a bear hug and a gimme-five-brother hand slap. Malta friendly, and I am instantly won over. Welcome aboard. We are going to make one hell of a movie. 
Have you met Joel? I not yet my way back to his trailer, where he shows me a plethora of pictures of his baby and wife, and does everything to make me feel at ease and relaxed. You gotta meet Joel. Suzanne, Joel's assistant, is trying to reach him on a mobile phone, and when she gets through, takes notes fast and replies even faster. That's Joel, says Bruce. Suzanne is still talking to him on the phone as his car squeals up and he invades the trailer. He is the energy field. Full and fleshly furnished, bearded, curly-haired and dark eyes constantly darting behind big-rimmed glasses, and the voice. A raspy runaway train of command and cajole. I'm at once transfixed and terrified, like a rabbit caught in the headlamp glare of his personality. Find myself taking three deep breaths before trying to enter his fray which I do, giving him a replay of the photo session with Sandra as fast and as funny as I can muster and make it to the first base when he laughs. Although he is probably only a few years my senior, I feel like guppy bait to his shark. Joel tells me that he is a hands-on producer, which I don't doubt for a millisecond. Conversation is dollar thick with the projected box office prospects for Bruce and Joel's latest joint venture, Die Hard 2, and something muscular with Schwarzenegger or Stallone. You coming to the premiere? demands Joel. I'm booked to fly home from Monday. Nah, you want to come, you gotta see this. Change your flight. Suzanne, do it. She does, and I do. Not that I'm forced against my will, you understand, but there is something unavoidable about Mr. Silver when he issues a command. 2nd of July, L.A. premiere of Die Harder, Westwood Cineplex, 8 p.m. Police whistles, wolf whistles for busty babes, and the photographers yell the first names of their starry prey to get their shots. Sandra is a veteran of late-night chat shows and has a sassy quip for every comer, blaséing her way along the press corridor with aplomb, fending the Madonna mania questions coming at her. Who's the guy? they shout. My co-star and the next big one from Bruce and the Boys. It's only when I'm sent a picture of the two of us with Joel Silver that I realize just how dorkish I really felt doodling along. As the credits roll, there is whooping and cheering and clapping and everyone is 16 again. Die hard, we know, and we are grateful for what we are about to receive. Before the end titles have rolled, before the lights have brightened, the stalls are erupting. Human lava flow over the back of the seats, scrambling to get within reach of the volcanic epicenter of this hit, namely Messrs. Willis and Silver Inc. Hands are clasped, cheeks kissed, tears mopped, and it's like a revival meeting at Lourdes. Perhaps by touching the immortals, you too will be blessed with fame and financial salvation. Popcorn is hurled in the air like confetti. I meet the financial and physical muscle of Tinseltown in the persons of Mr. Stallone and Mr. Schwarzenegger, both of whom are taking turns to bear-hug Bruce, both of whom are substantially shorter than six foot, which surprises me. Sandra demands we get out of here and over to the party before everything gets eaten up. I'm starved, which we do escaping the hit hive. The party is at Joel Silver's house at the discreet residential end of Hollywood Boulevard. He is a collector of houses, those of architect Frank Lloyd Wright, and has invested huge amounts of both passion and greenbacks into restoring these sites. Now we are in the pages of Architectural Digest celebrity home feature in 3D. Sandra and I shamelessly case the joint and marvel at the civilized splendors on display. How does a man like Joel, who makes big, noisy, action-packed live cartoon films, equate with this opposite order of things? Joel seems to enjoy my obvious astonishment and gives me a quick tour of his obsession, pointing out where and how he has had everything restored. Jesus, Joel! This is the last kind of place I thought you'd be shacked up in. He just laughs. He seems to revel in this contradiction, which is wholly endearing. I meet Danny Aiello, who plays Bruce's partner in crime in the film, and blow some fan smoke up his nethers about his great work in Spike Lee's film Do the Right Thing. Danny talks a lot. I'm an Italian, Rich. We like to talk. What can I tell you? He has no problem in finding something. Followed by Dimmy Moore. You pronounce it Dimmy. She corrects my Dimmy. Her voice is extraordinarily deep. You sound like a ruptured carburetor, which makes her laugh. She has those kind of bore-through-your-skull green eyes that kick-start male hormone circulation from naught to sixty in a couple of seconds. Bruce and I loved with nail and advertising. Funny stuff. Have you met everyone? She takes my arm and wheels me round the throng. It is their big night, and she is in no way obliged to hike me around, but I'm more than delighted to have her introduce me in her throaty vocals. Later, I stagger out, stunned but sober, and am ferried back to my hotel. Real life in between. A friend got married, another friend died. Devastating.
We have bought an ancient little pile in Provence and prepare for our first holiday. I am contracted to Hawk for a total of 22 shooting days over three months, plan to commute between Rome and Nice. The first sign that something is awry is signalled by a phone call from the dwarf. Your start date in Rome has been delayed. Shooting in New York has not gone according to schedule, so you're on hold for a week or so. Enjoy your holiday. Nothing too unusual, although it does seem very early on to fall behind. 31st of July. I take the 2 p.m. flight to Rome, then a taxi through the pouring rain, and arrive at the Excelsior Hotel. I get a room and locate Miss Bernhardt, who is in the Hotel Angleterra below the Spanish Steps. We arrange to have dinner with a director friend of hers and two jerks. It's August. Every Italian has left town for the holidays, and those who are left behind don't want to know. Only 10% of eateries are functioning, and then at half-mast with a skeleton staff. La Bernhardt is totally fearless about saying what she thinks and berates Romans in general, and those in her immediate vicinity in particular, for their rampant sexism. Can't you guys stop scratching your fucking balls for one second? Leave your cocks alone and give a girl some service round here. Jesus! The all-purpose expression of disdain for Americanos flickers across a couple of faces, and I suspect that our chances of getting a bowl of pasta will keep us slim. 2nd of August. James Coburn is in the makeup van. With his voice gallon deep and the requisite cigar jammed into the corner of his mouth, he is as movie icon cool as it's possible to get. Only his hands are arthritic, and he explains that the agony of this disease has kept him from working these past few years. Lassoes the lot of us with his silvery-haired charm. Bruce has two bodyguards in tow, ex-Israeli armyites who shadow his every move. He is constantly quipping, and give me fire, brothering, about. There is a distinct rock and roll flavor in his loose-limbed, let's get it on, attitude. Though Bruce is not the director, he has conceived and co-written the original story and has an untouchable King Midas aura about him, buoyed up by the box office bonanza of Die Harder, which has taken more than a hundred million bucks in the USA alone. The campy, cartoonish style of the script demands a somewhat over-the-top attitude. Bruce is demanding I go stark, raving mental, despite my reluctant excuse that if I start this wigged out, there will be nowhere left to go in my subsequent scenes of dementia. You can't be insane enough in this movie. During a break, Michael Lehman, the director, sidles up to the window and says to ignore this advice and to do less. Things get real speedy when news comes through that the private jet standing by to take Bruce and Joel to Nice for the weekend has to leave by 8.30 p.m. As I do not work again for another week, Bruce and Joel generously offer me a free flight. Madonna is on tour in Nice and they want to go to see her. Joel says mid-flight that I am the best fake Jew he has ever met, which I take as a compliment. What drives you to want to act? Revenge. This makes him laugh. Why? To prove to all those little fuckers who said you can't, you'll never make it, that I could. Me too. It's the same for me. This is not the common ground I had anticipated sharing with Joel. Maybe his laughter is similarly surprised, for the kind of actors he usually works with are heroic avengers in perilous action epics rather than skinny English Nancy poms. Have a sense that we are skirting around liking each other, despite operating on totally different tables. Yet the very instant he reveals his underbelly, the hatches come down, fast. I do not generally get to fly around in private planes and understand the true meaning of that old 60s epithet, jet set, as ready, set, go, through customs, security, unhindered. They are met by a waiting car and sped off to Saint-Tropez for the night. I rent one, which takes almost as long to organize as the flight from Rome, and drive out of this high-octane speedway for a familiar week in Provence, where all this intensity recedes as fast as their taillights into the night. It's only a movie, blips through my head. 8th of August. Call to fly back to Rome. Get there, and I'm told that I'm not needed until Monday. We hear the doodlebug news that Marushka Detmers is being replaced, and that the reason for desperately seeking Madonna was to ask if she would take over. Impossible, as she is mid-tour. Followed by a rundown of all the possible alternatives, beginning with Joanne Wally Kilmer, and then a ruthless canter through the ladies of the Screen Actors Guild, a verbal casting couch. 13th of August. Mussolini's old headquarters, located in what remains of Benito's new Rome. Endless delays. What might normally take three or four hours to complete ends up eating eleven. The problem is threefold. Bruce, Joel and Michael all have differing ideas. The Detmer's departure hasn't helped any, and the schedule is now seriously up the crock. Joel is on the mobile phone to the States. Frustrated by the eight-hour time difference, he looks ready to levitate. 
What the fuck is fucking wrong with this country that it should be eight fucking hours ahead of everywhere else? Answer me, you fuck. For one bone-shattering second, I thought he was asking me, his eyes just happening to flick my way for an instant. Answer, fuck. Someone picks up the phone, and the wake-up call he gets is a classic. You tell that fucking dick brain to stick her up his aging ass, or you fuck-faced wasp, that if he had any decency, he would have returned my car instead of acting like his shriveled old dick was already in the Metropolitan Museum of fucking. We could have had a deal. We could have done the fucking deal. No, you listen to me. You get all of this problem is he's just too fucking old. You got that fight, fight faded. As his finger stabs the off button, he's already all sweetness and light, and I could swear he has hugely enjoyed this. I have never seen this kind of human explosion firsthand, misguidedly believing it only really exists in Marvel comics. But this is kapow, zap, splat, and kaboom for real. This could give you a heart attack, Joe. This is what prevents one, he counters. At the end of this 40-degree day, the German director of photography unleashes a full frontal argument with the director at the base of the steps. German blames American for the endless delays. American counterattacks, saying that this is not the time or the place. German is not to be quelled. Insults bazooka back and forth. Bruce muscles in and says, Get the fuck out of here and argue somewhere else, as he's trying to get his reverse close-up done. Then he retreats. Joel charges forth, and the three of them hiss and fizz round the back of the trailer, the protagonists emerging all purple of face for the remainder of the day. Meanwhile, Danny Aiello is doing a one-man cabaret outside his trailer, as he has been hanging around since 6 a.m. and has said not so much as a scripted line. Amid this furore stands Flint himself, James Coburn, as calm and collected as those car adverts for which he does the voiceovers. This is a big-budget movie with big-budget egos. Enjoy. His smile widens a couple of toothy miles. Maybe it's to do with this day being the 13th. However, I know that when excuses run to superstition, it's time for bed. 16th of August. Rumor in L.A. has it that the Hawk budget has spiraled to $46 million, which explains why so many executive suits have flown in to assess the mess. 17th of August. Chinichita Studios, Rome. Joel Silver's office has been decked out with faux Roman frescoes and columns and drapes. It is the setting for a photo shoot involving Mr. and Mrs. Mayflower and their psychotic butler in sadomasochistic poses and leatherwear. These pictures are to be a joke for a later scene during which we are showing Hudson Hawk's slides of our gold-making activities, which have been inadvertently mixed up with scenes of our proclivities. Standing about in Vargas girl high heels, crotchless leather panties, brassiere, stockings, and lipstick, like a lost member of some touring Rocky Horror show, is the exact moment that I know, beyond all reasonable doubt, that this movie is a one-way ticket out of my mind. 12th of September. Fly to Milan. Picked up and driven to Rimini on the coast, Grand Hotel de Rimini. Mosey down into the marbled, bepalmed lobby, and unexpectedly meet Demi, baby and nanny, who ask why my little tot is not around. Demi as direct, warm and funny as when we first met, and coping with the all-too-familiar syndrome of being separated from her husband for long stretches by work. Andy McDowell and her husband and two little ones are also here, and this influx of family induces instant homesickness. When the crew returns, everyone is invited to go out and eat in one huge party. Being in a new town and all staying in the same hotel makes for a much more cohesive atmosphere. However, the schedule is like a veritable hydra. Every time a day is lopped off here or there, two others seem to grow back in its place, and we are now seriously behind. There are rewrites, new pages, new schedules. The script resembles a Crayola color chart, as every amendment is committed in a different hue. Not that this is unusual. It's just that this film has more than I've ever seen before. My death scene in the original version involved a fight between Bruce and me in the back of the purple limousine, ending in stand-up fisticuffs through the sunroof. This reveals that the car is hurtling down the interior corridors of the Kremlin before it crashes into a vast statue of Lenin, which topples forward, resulting in the decapitation of Mayflower. Hence, the plan had been to shoot the last part of the film in Budapest, which would stand in for Moscow, but be cheaper and closer. For a variety of reasons, all of this has been kiboshed, and the finale rewritten to take place atop the Mayflower Castle in Italy, hence Rimini, the closest big town to the location. But the seriously insane news is that we are still scheduled to go to Budapest to shoot Italian interiors inside a Hungarian studio owned by a producer living in Los Angeles. This seems like the logic of a deranged baboon. But I know that everything is dictated by the dollar, and as I have never understood even elementary mathematics, I surrender my skeptical self to the coming derailment. 
An assistant asks why I'm here already, as I'm not due to work until Friday. The schedule has switched to night shooting, meaning you leave for work late afternoon, drive to the location in San Limo, the castle perched on a lone tooth of rock, which takes close on an hour to reach, rehearse, set up, and eventually start, finishing as dawn breaks. Back to Rimini, and then try to sleep during the noisy day until you're due to leave again. Whichever way you try to do it, night shooting is a guaranteed strain for everyone. Exhaustion takes hold and temper shred fast. By midnight on Saturday, the mainly Italian crew are mutinous with fatigue and anti-American sentiment. The much-touted chemistry between Hawke and his sidekick, played by Danny Aiello, is suffering industrial fatigue. As the film now climaxes in this castle setting, there are stunts to shoot, fights to stage, and the purple Chrysler to be detonated, all of which are to be filmed outdoors all at night and all will be bitterly cold. A second camera unit is added to the already large crew crowded in and around this medieval fortress, built on this finger into the sky. With the latest rewrite, the Hawk Mayflower confrontation in the Purple Chrysler has been altered. It's now a semi-finale involving a fight between Danny Aiello and me. The actual finale, where I get my comeuppance, electrocution and immolation in molten gold, takes place in the gold room inside the Italian castle. However, the gold room set is under construction in a studio somewhere in Hungary. Go figure. The second camera unit, directed by stunt supremo Charlie Bacerni, is assigned to cover this new fight, which starts rehearsals at around 3 a.m. We are all semi-catatonic by now. Without our actual director, Danny takes the opportunity to exercise some directorial muscle, with the result that what seemed on paper to be a simple punch-up and scrap in a car scene has ballooned into an Orson Wellesian epic of motivation and varied possibilities. Let's do it, pronto presto! Head punches are choreographed with Danny thumping just past each of my ears, me jerking my head left to right, the camera wedged close behind, and at an angle to give the illusion that I'm having my brains pounded out. After which, I manage somehow to hurl myself out of the car as it careers over the mountainside with Danny and the butler inside it. This fight takes place in a stationary position, the movement simulated by out-of-shot crew members rocking the car. No sooner is this completed than a stunt double has to leap out of the runaway vehicle and roll away to safety. Everyone is out to watch the car double going over the clifftop and being detonated by remote control. Multiple cameras cover to make sure this one-off stunt is captured on film. It also means the death of the Aiello character, as he is trapped inside the car, but not before my character taunts him on the car phone for one last demonic cackling, Arrivederci! However, the prospect of not being around for the happy ending has set Danny a thinking and a scheming. Just how his character could possibly survive an exploding limousine plunging over a cliff would defy most logicians. But hey, this is a movie. Anything can happen. Danny has concocted a plotline in which his character is secretly kitted out with a hidden parachute, the idea being that once he has said his goodbyes on the phone to me, he will fling himself out of the by now airbound vehicle, pull his parachute cord, and land safely down below in them their old Tuscan hills. I assume this proposal a joke. The ramblings of any actor who might have become deranged by the experience of an endless shoot and being far away from home. But clearly, he has given this a lot of thought and actually succeeds in getting this suggestion legitimized. Having escaped the nuke limo inferno, we next see him astride a donkey, joining the hero and heroine for one last cappuccino before the credits roll. Come the big day comes the blowout, which goes something like this. Our protagonist emerges from makeup and wardrobe with appropriately post-car explosion smoking clothes and black patched face ready to mount the unsuspecting donkey. However, Danny's hairdo is still, as the Italian hairdresser would say, Rosanna Brazzi, full blow waved and set. Joel, upon seeing this oversight, marauds into the makeup trailer to berate the ladies therein for not giving him the electrified topsy look in keeping with the rest of the post-explosion apparition. It transpires that Danny felt this would be over the top, at which point the last vestiges of sanity surely take flight. Discussion ensues between director, producer and star, and within a short overture's worth, La Scala's fiercest notes are screaming through the air, culminating in a command that hair must be must. This causes something to short-circuit below the Rosanna Brazzi, and Danny is off and screaming. Integrity! bobs up and down among the flotsam and jetsam of his tirade. Nobody has the right to challenge his hair decision. This is surely the result of many weeks' frustration, and instead of punching live flesh, a lighting truck is preferred for the actual fisting. First aid and bandaging follow, as does remorse and follicular compromise. Half a Brautzi. 
Despite Rimini's reputation as the resort where Fellini grew up and to which he returned for his nostalgic Amacord film, it was with night shot relief that I left for London. 17th of September. Fly back to Rome to the aptly titled Minerva Holiday Inn, as the Inglaterra is full to next week. News arrives that the Budapest schedule has been delayed until the end of the month, as there is still so much to complete in Rome. I am taken to the studios to find that I am not required until tomorrow. Ho and hum back to the hottie. Messages from Sandra. Before I have a chance to unpack and call up, she's on the blower. And how? Hysterical. Turns out her New York agent is still quivering from the explosive detonated in his ears by Joel Silver. Why? Why? Cause he gotta hear stuff I'd said about the movie in L.A. these past few weeks and he's threatened to fire my lily-white gay ass. I rally round fast to her hotel and it's a scene straight out of Valley of the Dolls. She has lost nine pounds and looks distinctly stick insectish. She gives a garbled replay of her agent's version of events. You tell that effing Bernhardt bitch she can go fuck herself and I will fire her if she says another word about this movie while it's still shooting and who the fuck does she think she fucking thinks she is? On my way to bed, I run into the twin Martin brothers playing another set of goombas who have just got back from a four-week break in L.A. and are chock full of the latest industry revelations and rumors about the runaway budgets and going on. They conclude their duet of doom with... The word on the street is bad, like we were in some schlocky episode of Dick Tracy. 8th of October. Sandra does some prostration and bandage work on Jewel. 11th of October. My dad died nine years ago today at the age of 51. We buried him in the mountaintop cemetery in Ember Barn, down in Swaziland, with a view of the Ezelwini Valley, meaning Valley of Heaven, which it is. Our house on the adjacent mountainside has the same sweeping panoramic view that stretches for 40 miles. My father had been Minister of Education during the English colonial jurisdiction of Swaziland until independence in 1968, after which he was made an honorary advisor. When he contracted cancer, much of his looking back was riddled with self-doubt about his not having contributed anything of lasting value to the country, and he concluded that perhaps any white man in Africa is inherently a paradox. His funeral proved otherwise. I wish he could have been there. My father was fluent in Siswati, and honoured with a Swazi name, Mashlaginipani, which translates as the man whose thoughts run faster than his feet. All doubts about his relationship with the Swazi people he had known, befriended and worked with, were laid to rest this day. For as far as you could see, there were crowds of Swazis interspersed with the remnants of the colonial old guard, all here to pay their last respects. At 11 a.m., his coffin was already six feet below in the as-yet unfilled grave. Pat Forsyth Thompson gave an oration that covered his life and managed to be both funny and profound, followed by an address from a young Swazi priest fresh from an evangelical course in the USA. What happened next was Monty Python meets Joe Orton. After an incredibly emotive speech, the Swazi priest leapt suddenly down into the grave on top of the casket and began to unscrew the bolts, while chanting in a near trance-like state that he was going to raise the dead! I am going to raise the dead! My stepmother staggered sideways. People crammed forwards, and within no time he had the lid off and was commanding and beseeching that his faith and power resurrect my dad. A terrible curiosity forced my eyes to look below and see what I did not want to see and what I saw was the near-skeletal remnant of my pater, waxen and gone, as unlikely a candidate for resurrection as ever there was. After I don't know how long, young Gumedze, now weeping and wailing uncontrollably, gave up his evangelical quest for a miracle, and had to be helped out of the hole and consoled for what he felt was his failure of faith. At that moment, I knew just how much I was always going to miss my father, for it was exactly the kind of idiosyncratic event that made life in Swaz that bit different from anywhere else. It would have made him laugh. It was only later, while sitting reading through the cards, that I was undone by a crumpled scrap of paper, written in a barely legible hand that simply stated, Goodbye, Baba Mashlaginipani. Don't forget us. This inversion of the usual, We will never forget you, pinpointed exactly the feeling of having been left behind among the living. Six months later, I left for England, my past quite literally another country. I discovered this scrap of paper in my diary nine years later in Rome. I am grateful for the elixir of work on this anniversary day, 
Finally, a proper scene to get the Nashes out for. Everything goes just tickety-smoochy, and the atmosphere is relaxed and productive. Joel, Bruce, and Michael give their approbation by saying every now and again, You two are funny, as if mildly surprised by this discovery. Playing someone richer than Messrs. Willis and Silver, and carrying on as though I own the universe, is unavoidably underlined as mere acting when in the company of two real mega-rich men, who have the confidence and outward bravura of cosmic buccaneers. Attempting to act Mayflower power in their company gets panic a pacing my arteries, and I can feel my reserves of manic being sorely stretched. In fact, it is the one thing they openly admire, and like a performing poodle, I get up on my hind legs and prance about, suggesting that I conduct some of my speech stomping on top of the desk. Go for it, they encourage. When I get back to the hotel, I can't escape the nag that it all feels too close to the kind of high school play setup in which any insane suggestion is instantly cheered and endorsed. Except that this isn't school and everything, including new jokes and suggestions, translates into schedule delays and big bucks burning fast. The whiff of budgetary hysteria is ever-present. The weekend exodus is upon us again. Bruce has gone via Paris to catch the Concorde to New York. Joel has gone to Paris and suggested that Sandra and I come too, as Madonna is going to be there and we can all hang out. You paying, Joel? From Sandra floors my politesse. No harm in trying, is her response to my slack-jawed gape. Gotta hustle, honey. It's the only thing they understand. All this travel flurry creates a kind of mild panic, making you feel left out of the club if you're not bound for somewhere, anywhere other than old Roma. Two days in this circumstance have a way of suddenly looming up at you like a couple of months in solitary. At this desperate juncture, Sharon Stone, Shares, as she was instantly nicknamed, blonded her way into our orbit. She's here working on a thriller flick and is an old friend of Joel's. Turns out our plan to fly to Paris with him has been aborted at the last minute, so she too is at a loose end. She is incredibly stylish and sophisticated in a somewhat self-conscious way, as if she has watched a catalogue of Grace Kelly movies a little too closely. Sandra and I meet her in her rented apartment before going out to find some lunch. It's as hot today as the stage directions of any Tennessee Williams play, which provokes Shares to beg our patience while she finds something else to slip into. Sandra is onto this tactic fast. Dame wants an audience, for Christ's sakes. I dismiss this uncharitable thought momentarily until Shaz slinks back in like a cat on her own hot tin roof, sporting something purry, and pouts the question, What do you think? To which Sandra unceremoniously replies, I think I'm starving, let's get out of here. Which we do. Only our timing is all up the jacksy, and it's nearly 3 p.m. by the time we hit the restaurant trail. Near the Pantheon, we attempt to lasso the attention of the about-to-close restaurateur. Sandra motors in first, and her protestations of febrile hunger are met with a tut-tut, no, no. With an oh, fuck, she slopes round and says, so what do we do now? Watch this, says Shaz, with the winky glint of a seasoned assassin. And in she swishes to lay on her deadlies. Sandra is not easily impressed, and says we're wasting our time. No sooner has she uttered, then Shaz emerges with the beguiled and smiling proprietor in tow, who is now concave at the prospect of cooking us up anything we desire. She is bristling with her triumph as she fingers her way down the menu, then flutters an eyelash or two upward to the mesmerized male before giving her order, which he scribbles down without taking his eyes off her. From here on outward and into various shops, we are in her control. And we are her perfect audience, going with every whim and flow of her fancy, including visits to her favorite stores. We are being guided into a cut glass and cutlery joint that is for the seriously loaded, one of those stores where you practically need to be fingerprinted to get through the bulletproof glass doors. We gaze like method-acting devotees at the sparkling shelves of priceless glass, while Shaz works the grizzled old nanny goat who presides over all this luxe. I finally hear her say that she will be back ere long to make her final choice, and then turns, Hey guys, let's get out of here. It's all a game, and she delights in playing it, with us as innocent punters along for the ride. Along the way, I ask her whether she has had an affair with Joel, to which she demurs, but says that she likes a cuddly producer. Our final pit stop is the Versace store, where she is now choosing jackets for me to try on, for all the world as if we were old marrieds. So good for your eyes, this suit. Perfect match. It is with some hot, flushy discomfort that I escape the store without any clothes at all. 15th of October. Cruise into Joel's office at lunchtime to borrow a variety newspaper. Joel says... Come in, come in! So I hear you are asking what it's like to fuck a fat old Jew! My knees go first, followed by the rest, slumping fast into the sofa. Eyes dead ahead, 
ears ringing, nervous system approaching meltdown. Shaz, are you kidding? I asked her if she had had an affair with you, not fucked a fat old Jew. I am a fat old Jew, he roared. She's history, over and out of here. I never spoke to Shaz again. I also wonder whether these were her actual words, or whether Joe was giving me a dose of the fear, knowing I would nuke on cue. 23rd of October. Nina's restaurant for a farewell dinner, presided over by Joel, who was on top form at the prospect of finally leaving Rome for the final push into Budapest. Every pasta invented is brought forth. We are all charged with the prospect of the move, and Joel takes charge of the crippling bill for the meal, as usual. I attempt at least to pay my share, as he is always forking out, but as usual, he flatly refuses and says the Shaz episode alone was entertainment payment in itself. 31st of October 10 a.m. to Budapest, 1335 arrival. The Blue Danube is a slow sludge of industrial waste. There are endless queues of potato-faced humans in nylon flares, imitation Nikes, man, woman and child smoking in chain gangs. The Ramada Hotel, where we are impounded, is appropriately on an island in the middle of the Danube, between Buda and Pest. People cough a lot. I start too, and fear I have contracted lung cancer. 1st of November, my fourth wedding anniversary. I'm picked up and trekked out to the far-flung Ma Film Studios, an hours-plus drive out of the city, to shoot interiors set in Italy. Within, all seems indecisive, incapable and akimbo. While the cats are away, the mice will play. The rewritten scene is cue for everyone to offer an opinion. According to the front page of Variety, the budget has now racked up costs of 61 million greenbacks. No one openly talks about this stuff anymore. Bruce is increasingly Matahari-like. Now we see him, now we don't. We've shot almost entire scenes with his stand-in or stuntman, but are very glad he's back, because something gets done, albeit slowly. We have not been here a week, yet the overall atmosphere is underwritten by verbalized countdown syndrome. That is, counting down to your last day here. Yet the climax of the story has yet to be completed. 19th of November. Final, final, final week in Hungary. The first unit crew return from their weekend in London, where they have gone to shoot a sequence involving a miniature postal train. The end is in sight, and energy erupts. Briefly. I am told by the director that tomorrow, Tuesday, will be my last day. I cannot wipe the smile from my chops all day. 20th of November. Today is the day I get to be smothered in molten gold and killed off, and shoot my final world-dominating speech to Bruce Willis. Only we shot his reactions last week. Now I am giving an Ethel Merman-sized rant to his stand-in, which is never the same as having the real thing. Don't care right now. Anything to get this over with. By 4 p.m., we have completed a total of three camera setups, and the prospect of completing is nigh impossible. What's in a day? asks some Goomba. Now, I may not yet have adequately conveyed to you the minute-by-minute -minute excrucia of being here. But at this moment I have a profound inkling of what prison and parole feel like. The day they say you will leave looms so significantly that come the flip and flop casual of not today after all, followed up by a lazy maybe tomorrow or the next, it is enough to tip you over the edge. Sandra goes first upon hearing this news, and despite all her warrior instincts, she breaks down and blubs her heart out, but not before telling the harbinger of this bad news where to go do himself. Tuesday dribbles into Wednesday, the 21st, and someone very stupidly declares that Sandra and I will be out of here by lunchtime, only half a day, guys. To which Sandra retorts, yeah, and the pyramids were built in a week, which at least forces a smile onto my beak. Our half day is a full day of the usual disorganized, directionless bollocks. I am covered in molten gold and kitted out with a milky contact lens. However, the makeup department are threatening a work boycott as they have been working 36 hours non-stop on these effects. Dollars are wheelbarrowed in, and like parking meters, once paid, they displayed. Feel numbed today. Just numbed. Numb. That this final day has finally arrived is predictably not the cathartic release and relief that you imagine it might be. Nay, nay. Just the exhausted, spent, bleached, dull relief that it has come to its end. 22nd of November. Final indignity. A note at the hotel. Get your own taxi to the airport. Film unit drivers have been laid off. No matter. 
To top this day of release, upon landing at Heathrow, the euphoric headlines smashed across every London paper declare that Thatcher is out. Me too, Margaret, and none too soon. She no doubt out of her mind, and me equally unhinged with joy to be free of Hungary, Hawk, and her. 3rd of February, 1991. Fly to L.A. for two weeks for some casting meetings and to attend the premiere of L.A. Story. 4th of February. Phone wake up. Hi, it's Steve Martin. Want to have lunch? Sure, where? Indigo. Okay, bye. This is typical. He talks in telegraphies as though he last saw you five minutes ago. We meet and talk. He is all kitten on the keys about the movie, its first reviews and its box office prospects. Pauline Kael, mm, so-so, New York Times and Rolling Stone trashed it. This bad news is coming through in Morse code blips between mouthfuls of salad and punctuated by gulps of iced tea. I've shredded most of them already. I know the feeling. Concludes with a lunch check and I think I'm going to retire at the end of this year, which makes me laugh, which just about makes him laugh. We dawdle and dangle through the afternoon, treading water, lolling about. Victoria comes in from a meeting and seems unprepared to indulge in any gloom. They drive me down to the old MGM studios for the cast and crew screening, but don't attend themselves. Pick you up after. Howdy, howdy, howdy doody, my way through familiar faces, and the lights go down. Credits roll, and the atmosphere of watching a home movie engulfs, buoyed up by the enthusiastic applause that greets each credit, no matter how obscure. The opening credit sequence with La Mer, nostalgically crooned by Charles Trenet, tannering his way alongside witty, lush images of life in L.A., is inspired a guaranteed cue to sit back and enjoy. Andrew Dunn's cinematography is hockney in moving pictures. Usually, the first five minutes of a flick give you a gut feeling about what's to come, and this opening totally dispels Steve's lunchtime unease. Film is up and running, especially with this crowd. But, and this is going to be the hard part, the whole caboodle starts to sputter and stutter when the romance gets underway, between Steve and Victoria, between my hosts, between real-life husband and wife. No sooner has this dawned on me than the horrible stomach wrench of seeing just what I have produced blows any concern for them or anyone else out of the water. Try as I might to say, it's only a movie, it feels not unlike stepping onto an underground train worn to mind the gap over the tannoy and absently wrong-footing it and plunging down. Huge applause at the end, handshaking and you were greats, and through a side door and into the car where Stephen Victoria look a bit stretched about the gills. So what do you think? Oh, come on, you were great. So funny. The journey has as many, no, but you were great, as there seem to be traffic lights, at the end of which I don't think any of us was convinced. 5th of February, LA Story Premier. Spotlights and press phalanx, and we step out into a cacophony of police loudspeakers, walkie-talkies, a screamy shouting chorus of Steve that resounds past the assembled TV crews and photographers. I can feel a slight paralysis in my smiling cheeks, a ventriloquist doll moment. Once through this section, there is some milling about in introductions and handshakings. Then into the theatre. Ninety-five minutes pass by and people laugh. Sausage out the other end, and the adjacent shopping arcade has been transformed into a food arena. Eat some pizza and willingly believe Tom and Rita Hank's generous appraisal of my comic talents. Limo back to the Martins for some immediate post-mortem. If only I could have liked their movie as much as I liked them. 11th of February. Met the L.A. story cast at the Burbank Studios for the taping of the Mike Donahue chat show. Depending on who you spoke to, the weekend box office takings of $6.6 .6 million indicated a hit, whilst others seemed to deem it a so-so, compared to the double takings of our opposition, Sleeping with the Enemy, starring Julia Roberts. 14th of February. Valentine's Day. Phone home. Sandra Bernard has invited me to a Valentine's night party at Madonna's house. Meet Sandra, and we drive up into the hills above the Spargo's Tower Records Junction on Sunset Boulevard in West Hollywood. Suddenly feel self-conscious about what I am wearing, and feel an attack of the wallies coming on. Uh, will there be lots of people? Who knows? Relax, honey. Wind endlessly round and up the hillside, and up a cul-de-sac, that ends with a large, solid metal gate, beside which stands an equally solid human, built like the proverbial, with hand up in, Halt! Who goes there? position. Leans in and checks out the interior of Sandra's sedan, ignores her attempts at being matey and says, Hold it there. Goes back to the intercom, buzzes, returns and says where to park. Metal wall shifts sideways and we park next to a couple of jeeps. Maybe we're too early. Relax. Another action man with a walkie-talkie appears and grunts to go in. Through a door at the back of the double garage into the kitchen we go. 
There are no other guests, let alone a party, in sight. Are we too early? No, hi, I'm Madonna. And I'm slightly stupefied. Happy Valentine's. She is tiny and alabaster white, bleached blonde with a smash of scarlet lipstick, and altogether startling in the flesh. Much softer looking than the image affixed in my head, and so petite, sculpted into a Dolce & Gabbana black corset and knee-length black leggings, with her well-documented cleavage quietly heaving like Sleeping Beauty at Disneyland. I am in a somewhat transfixed state for a few minutes, and am guided lamb-like to sit down in the high-tech steel and shiny wood-floored eating area. When I drink... Sandra is high honeying and hugging her, and I am wondering why the hell we are here alone on Valentine's. There are no other people coming. A large television is mounted way up a wall and bleating MTV very loudly, below which there is a steel frame with criss-cross wires, over which are draped every glossy magazine like a sort of media clothesline. Three have her face on the covers. This is Tony, who wanders in through the garden doors in low-slung jeans, Calvin Klein shorts exposed, shirtless with a waistcoat, fag in mouth, and a bottle of beer in hand, like he was in a Levi's commercial, which he may well have been. Later, a friend of Tony's lopes in and says, Hi, Madonna, like he was bored already, at which she queries Tony, Why are all your friends such losers, huh? His friend seems immune to this insult, and the two of them go off to get some beers. Let's get out of here! And we follow our leader into a Cherokee jeep, rev up and career down the winding roads to Sunset Boulevard, and head for a club in Hollywood, our hostess at the wheel, causing adjacent drivers at the traffic lights to pose in paralysis as they grapple with her real-life apparition. The club is a converted theatre, and we're here to see one of her backup singers, Nikki, sing a set of songs she is releasing on her own. Madonna arm-in-arms me through the doors into the foyer where managers, doormen, bouncers are all having that paralysis thing to a man. She is giggling now at all this and says, See? As grown men walking backwards down a narrow backstage corridor look as if they wished they could red carpet lay their very tongues for her to walk upon. This attention clearly feeds her capricious nature. We meet up with Nicky, dressed in a 70s bell-bottom catsuit a la Carmen Miranda. You gotta get better publicity pictures, girl, quoth M, eliciting a puncture-faced mini-collapse of confidence in Nicky, just as she's about to platform shoe her way on stage. Madonna, like a moth to her fame, grips the balcony rail, leans forward and gives the house her once over. It's dark in here, and the value of being sepulchrally pale and platinum blonde pays off. Everything else is dark around her, and by the count of twenty, the heaving dancing mass below has become a swaying choreography of one, all gyrating, all looking up, and only at her. Like a gospel gathering. It is pure Perron. As if timed, once the room is hers, she turns her attention to the much-insulted Tony and eats his face, kissing him like they were condemned. After having arrived here as a group of five, we make for the car park surrounded by five hundred, people screaming, Madonna, Madonna! We career back up the winding road to Mount Madonna, and I'm dispatched into my own car with a sharpish, Good night and thanks, see you around. First of May. Columbia TriStar Pictures request your presence at the press and premiere of Hudson Hawk in L.A. Fly Thursday, 16th of May. 18th of May. Annie McDowell and I are whisked off for a late afternoon screening, being the only ones not to have seen the result. Empty screening room at Columbia Studios, each with our agents, each unable to look each other, or anyone else for that matter, in the eye at the end, shell-shocked into the blazing evening sunshine. Premiere. Same place, same time, same guests as last year's Die Hard 2 launch, except Robert Altman and Tim Robbins are seated directly behind me. What are you doing here? I'm in it. How about you? Oh, Tim and I are here doing a little research, says he sotto voce. What are you doing next month? I'm going back to London. Working? No. I may have something for you. This momentarily kickstarts my circulation, until the reality of what this man is about to witness freezes thought. I remember how this cinema erupted at the end of Die Hard and engulfed Bruce, while tonight you would swear some miraculous special effects crew had been in to make a thousand people disappear. By the time the house lights are up, the stalls are all bare, like that old emperor's balls. 24th of May, Memorial Day holiday weekend. Hudson Hawk opens on 2,000 screens across the country and bombs in all of them, while Altman offers me a job to play a screenwriter in the player, from the ridiculous to the sublime. At the very moment I thought I would never work that cliché in this town again, I feel well and truly saved. 20th of June, L.A. Is that Richard? Hi, it's Bob. You get in all right? Listen, I got some new ideas for the first scene. If you're not too jet-like, come over to Malibu for dinner. 
21st of June, drove round to the production offices, the Altman Atmos is familiar and easygoing. Meet Stephen, the production designer, who is one of Bob's sons. Signy, production assistant, one of his daughters. Meet Bob, who uncles an arm around me, like we've known each other all our lives, and says, So, what do you think? Want to see some dailies? And we flap through a makeshift curtain into the impromptu screening room to see running footage of scenes already shot. Stuff with Tim Robbins that looks like a documentary. Real. Bob then relates this idea he has, which is that as the film is about Hollywood, he wants to populate all the scenes with real movie stars playing the background crowd of extras. I am to play Dean Stockwell's writing-directing partner. I am given extra dialogue for Monday night, the pitch I have for the film within the film. 22nd of June. Breakfast with Bruce Robinson, who is renting a vast villa owned by Gore Vidal on Outpost Drive, some remove from their terraced house in Wimbledon. Bruce is exceptionally smiley this sunny morn, having had his film Jennifer 8 greenlit to the tune of a generous budget from Paramount Pictures. Tours me round the house, says he is giving up smoking Monday morning, and offers up a cabaret of the kinds of things writers do when pitching a film to the men in suits, which is what my part requires me to do in two days' time. As I have to conjure up torrential rain in my opening gambit, I should, he suggests, try doing some sound effects. Are you kidding? No, anything. People will do anything to get their pitch across. He takes me through my whole speech, offering ideas and stories which are cruel and funny, and which I console myself, are all in the name of research, that particularly prominent recent phenomenon that seems to have taken hold since Robert De Niro gained tonnage for Raging Bull. 24th of June. First night shoot on the player. 5 p.m. call. Location, St. James Club on Sunset Boulevard. The first part of the scene involves some typically Hollywood schmooze talk from the writer-producer partners, played by myself and Dean, trying to grab the attention of Annie McDowell, who appears as herself supposedly having a drink in the club bar. Just before shooting, I go for some bladder relief, stare at my reflection, and have a mini-seizure about not looking in character. Panic, and more my withered locks this way and that, and suddenly see possibilities in a neo-Adolf Hitler style. I take a deep breath and push through the swing doors, wondering whether someone will send me back with a come off it. Nobody does, and having done it, I feel different. I've convinced myself that I now look every bit as pretentious as my character requires. Bob suggests I smoke thin cigarellos. Malcolm McDowell is here to appear as himself in the club lobby, and having been so mesmerized by him in A Clockwork Orange, I find myself unable to say much more than, uh, pl pleased to meet you but I stare out of the corner of my eye every time he hovers, thrown back to 1972 and sneaking out to see a midnight screening while supposedly cramming for O-levels. Even though I know how films are made and a performance created, there remains something about a screen creation I find hard to separate from the actor who has embodied the role, with the result that no matter what else I've seen Malcolm McDowell in, his Alex is forever lurking. My pitch involves selling Tim Robbins the condensed storyline of a movie in less than 25 words. Ready, set, go. And as I am playing someone in a high old state of anxiety and punctuating with quick drags on the cigarillo, my lungs are now apoplectic and hyperventilating. After a couple of takes, my stomach caves in and three meals hurtle out of my mouth. Only I haven't managed to make it off the set and am forced to offload into a large potted palm at the entrance. Oh, my God! Gasps in the near vicinity as I begin a round of apologies for having heaved so publicly and violently. You should have told her she can't smoke. Feeling like a right wally, I lie down for a bit before going back for another go. This ever happened to you before? asks Bob. Not quite. During the final rehearsal day for Withnail, but then I was leglessly drunk. Cut the cigarella, then. I'll just have a go trying not to inhale it this time, but uh, I got a bit excited during the last few takes, that's all. So it's not my direction, then. 26th of June. Bob says to feel free to come and watch the big party scene scheduled for the evening. Mostly when filming, free days are so valued that going to watch other people work is about the last thing you want to do. Except my time on this is a total of a week's worth over a month, and people are Jack Lemmon playing the piano at a typical Hollywood party by the pool, Sally Kellerman, the eponymous hot lips hula hand from MASH, leg in plaster cast, humming to Mr. Lemmon's tinklings, Rod Steiger standing in a window, figuring out how a window waterfall is working, Jeff Goldblum descending a spiral staircase, director Sidney Pollack playing a power broker, Harry Belafonte in conversation with Robert Wagner and Jill St. John, Marley Maitland speaking in sign language to Danny Thomas, in the midst of which Tim Robbins and Cynthia Stevenson are operating as real characters amongst the real thing. Come 1 a.m., Bob announces, I'm sure I could keep you lovely folks out here all night and shoot the shit out of this scene, but I can't think of anything else to do, so I suggest we all just go home. Thanks very much. You were all wonderful. Brilliant performances of yourselves. Good night. Gets a round of applause. 
1st of July. Universal Studios for location lunch with Steve Martin and Diane Keaton. She is very funny, yet unwrite-downable. I have a meeting for Dracula with Francis Ford Coppola the following evening and ask Diane if she has any advice. She looks into the middle distance as if her godfather past were just hovering there, pauses, then says, Oh, Francis is just, well, like Francis. Again she smiles at some private recollection and looks up as if her enigmatic answer was perfectly clear and almost as an afterthought says, You'll be fine. Fine. And that's it. She leaves you sort of dangling mid-air, though you know her sentence is full stopped, just like Annie Hall. 2nd of July, meeting with Mr. Coppola. I pass the giant doors of various studios the size of aircraft hangars. Hook set, closed to all visitors. Do not enter without authorization. This skull and crossbones message is painted red across door after vast door. Scenery trucks are piled up with dying foliage outside, and chunks of fake tree trunks render adults the size of lost boys which is about what I feel like on my way to finding and meeting Mr. Coppola, past the Judy Garland building and into Joan Crawford, and there's Francis, all in black with red braces and psychedelic tie, and, well, like Francis. He does not sit, and pads back and forth, talking and gesticulating, as if needing invisible pizza dough. Whereas I was told to prepare for a screen test, he has overshot that already and is telling me what a great role Dr. Seward is, how many ideas he has, what the shooting dates will be, and how he is currently hassling with the money man to make a deal possible. I sit wondering when he is going to ask me at least to read a scene for him. But then the meeting is over, he is gone, and I am out and vaguely dazed. Wander along in, was he, did he, state of flux, when a voice with short red hair yells, Richard, from some distance. Knowing no one here, I turn to look behind me to see which Richard is being hailed. Richard, come here! I obey, and am greeted by the kilowatt smile of Tinkerbell, a.k.a. Julia Roberts, sporting pointy elfin ears, red boy's wig, and leather leaf costume. What are you doing here? I tell her, and she asks, Will you stay and play a while? Do you want to meet Stephen? Tink links arms and leads me onto a sound stage past the beefy eyes of uniform security to meet Mr. Spielberg. Blink, blink. Eyes adjust to the interior dark and an upstanding legend. Manager, pleased to meet you. Surf his paws till he replies, You're with me, right? Oh, Swaz. A gigantic lantern erected in front of a blank screen is where Tinkerbell is perched, so big as to make Julia look very small. Wearing regulation baseball cap, jeans and T-shirt, Spielberg is like someone's teenage brother. I've got a meeting with your Prime Minister, John Major, later this year about funding the British film industry. Listen, would you mind trying to make Julia laugh in this little scene? Problem is, all her scenes are to uh, no one, as her stuff is all blue screen processed. Yes, yes, Mr. Spielberg. However many bagfuls, Mr. Spielberg. He talks so fast and so unassumingly that there is no time to fart and quaver, and Julia is hoisted up and I launch into some Hudson hawkery as it's still freshly roasting. She does laugh, although I wonder at the ethics of getting Tinkerbell to chortle at the shenanigans of Sandra Bernhardt couple of takes and Mr. Spiel is glad to meet you, and off on a caddy cart to another set. Murray Close, the English stills photographer, whom I know from Withnell, is snapping hook, and says to come and see Bob Hoskins. Julia asks if I want to meet for dinner later. I'll call and leave the address. This is all getting a bit too never-never land for me. Bob Hoskins is bearded up to play Pirate Smee, and reassures me that, Francis is brilliant, we'll cast you, you wait and see and relates how he was cast in the Cotton Club on a Friday, flown to New York, and started shooting the following Monday. When he speaks, his eyes widen, while his voice gruffs, with a fluctuating expression of surprise, like a grown-up child. Come on, meet Dustin. Mr. Hoffman is slumped in a chair on the deck of Captain Hook's ship, which is a huge life-sized recreation designed by John Napier, and is crawling with lost boys, pirates and technicians, afloat in a shallow tank of green sea. No doubt he has met boatloads of folk today, and I am reluctant to disturb his hook heels off time. Bob, go ons, and I merely mouth a, uh, sorry to disturb you, but very pleased to meet you. He asks, have you signed the visitor's book yet? The reputations of the director, stars, and sets have attracted head of state visitations. Fourth of July, Altman party in Malibu, dress code red, white, and blue. Plaster my clothes, hair, and face with U.S. flag stickers and trek up the coast looking like a stamped parcel for just about the best party I've ever been to. Why? Well, I'll try. Ease, in every sense. Their condo is on the Pacific Ocean. 
I don't mean near, but on the beach. The living room is dominated by the sound and sight of the pounding surf immediately beyond the wall-to-wall windows. Catherine Altman is the coolest, keenest hostess I know, makes everyone feel hugely welcome, every detailed arrangement seem effortless, unfussed. She's been married to Bob for thirty years, and they kind of top and tail one another with an outward show of ease, like hand-hewed spoons. They are somewhere in their sixties chronologically, but are indeterminately ageless and inquisitive. Ease. Most of the cast cruises in, and the unexpected coup is to have cast musicians in the film. Angela Hall, fresh from the Broadway run of Black and Blue, has brought her tap shoes and starts dancing and singing with a jazz trio. She's followed up by Annie Ross, who lays down some true smoked Scottish salmon pink blues. People are listening, eating, dancing, talking, 4th of Julying. Then it's Lyle Lovett's set of lyrical, haunted Texan dry ballads, accompanied by a cello and that drum that sounds as if someone is falling asleep while swishing something across the floor. He, in turn, gives way to Tim Robbins playing guitar and singing Tom Waits songs, then gospel. Then there are fireworks over the ocean from Malibu Patriots. Food, candles, dancing, singing. Apart from the absence of my wife and baby, this is a night of perfect happiness, unalloyed, pure, enough to make me cry, knowing it in the moment, rather than reconstituted in memory. 13th of July. One of the producers of the player, Nick Wexler, and his associate Keith Addis, are giving a party at a house above Sunset Boulevard. I wander along a candlelit pathway into a party which has more stars orbiting than I ever saw this side of the silver screen. I beeline for Bob and Catherine Altman to get my bearings. No sooner am I anchored than a familiar but never met before face looms close and says, Hi, with disarming familiarity. I'm Mimi Rogers. How do you do? I know who you are. <laughs> Pleased to meet you. Exchange compliments and eat canapes. Can I join you guys? Why, sure. You meet each other before? No, but I know your work, so I feel like I do. Rosanna Arquette. This sort of conversation ebbs and flows for the rest of the evening. To my oblique left, Gabriel Byrne and Ellen Barkin are talking to Barbara Streisand. Barbara Streisand? I turn my head in what feels like slow motion and say, That's Barbara Streisand. To which Rosanna says, Yeah, do you know her? That's Babs, is all I can murmur. You do know her? No, Rosanna, no. Not know her. But Jesus, that's Barbara Streisand. Aged twelve in short pants and cropped hair, knees like knobbly knuckles, I saw Funny Girl. Having harboured an idea that I would one day become an actor, the effect of hearing this extraordinary person singing I'm the Greatest Star was seismic, as if she somehow knew exactly what was going on in my twelve-year-old head. I have never been a serial faller in love, and can count the number of times I've been thunderbolted. This was one. Soise meets Streisand. This ticker tape logo spools endlessly around my skull. It is flying around the room above everyone's heads, as if attached to a light biplane advertising above a crowded beach. Soise meets Streisand. Tonight, one performance only. As calmly as I can, I locate the hostess of the evening and splurged, I beg of you, please, can you introduce me to Barbara Streisand? She says to wait, goes over, confabs, comes back, and I sort of levitate my way towards her. Ellen Barkin moves off, and I heard these words. Barbara? This is Richard E. Grant, Richard, Barbara Streisand. Petite in a black hat and antique black lace dress with boots, she offers a hand and I plutzed. We chatted, during which time I have an overwhelming desire just to kiss her and wrap her round like that famous photo of the sailor in Times Square kissing a gal on the day the war ended. She proffers her tape at hand. I ask if I can kiss it, to which she laughs and says, OK, after which she saved any further frothings from me. The remainder of the evening is a cocktail party haze. On my way out, I cannot resist shooting a last glance at Babs, and I am invaded by a strange emptiness. The cross that any fan has to bear, that while this idol has such a significant place in my life and experience, I, of course, can have none in hers. I am just another geeky gusher. Twenty-two minutes exactly is what I had. 19th of August, 1991. 8 p.m. call from Agent Steve Dontonville in L.A. We have an offer on Dracula. You are cordially invited to a week's bonding at the Copper Estate in Napa Valley with the cast and director. Francis will be cooking dinner for 8 p.m. on Monday, the 2nd of September. Leaving my family after six weeks' holiday together is ghastly. My three-year-old daughter is keening and crying, and we are all undone in a mess of goodbyes. Fly to San Francisco, where I am met and driven into the Napa Valley. Arrive at a clapboard 30s bungalow. 
This is where Carrie Elway's Bill Campbell and myself, the three suitors in the film, are barracked. Bill the Rocketeer Campbell introduces himself like a dripping giant, having just jogged a couple of hundred miles. Carrie Elway's gets off the phone and offers me a cigarette in a mid-Atlantic Malibu Marlboro accent. Together, we walk up to the main house. The house is a three-story, white clapboard Victorian giant-style manse with wraparound veranda, enormous trees with benches around, manicured garden, pool, trampoline, and a panorama of vineyards and the Napa Mountains in the dusky distance. Norman Rockwell and Edward Hopper scapes. Perfect. Whether it's the time of day, heat, or jet lag, there is an air of pre-supper somnambulance with people dotted about like American Chekhov. Gary Oldman, sitting on the wide veranda, ambles over and hugs me with a Hello, my darling, in his distinctive little boy lost mode, and declares he is feeling rat assed Having recently seen him in State of Grace, brilliantly portraying an unhinged state of mind with brutal physicality, it is a measure of his art that his slight frame can transform so extraordinarily in performance. There is little in his demeanour that gives any clue to his volcanic interior. The last time I saw him was in Paris while he was romancing Uma Thurman but he shakes his head and says his eleven-month marriage to her is over. Winona Ryder appears, wearing a forties flower print dress, sporting her minute eighteen-inch waist. I told you you'd be in it. This is so great. Anthony Hopkins tracks suits up, having done a vineyard circuit, looks suntanned and fit, asks after Joan, with whom he has worked, and reminds me of the day and date we met some years ago. I met him once, and only briefly, but his recollection is photographic and unnerving. I had read that he loathed any kind of family-type setup, which this week ahead is designed to be, and I am not surprised to learn that he is in a separate guest house alone. Again, his shy, diffident manner is in total contrast to the seismic quakery of his performing self. Feel a bit frightened of him. Awed. Goes through the copper-potted kitchen that is bubbling and boiling and smelling spaghetti sexy. Francis is cooking for a large number, claiming he wouldn't know how to cook for two. 3rd of September, 9 a.m. sharp. The clan gathers in a converted barn that is a mini sound stage. Big square of tables and chairs. Copies of the Bram Stoker original in lieu of a place setting. I am playing Dr. Seward, sidekick to Dr. Von Helsing, played by Anthony Hopkins, and one of the three men obsessed with Lucy. Francis arrives, everyone takes their place, and he begins. Actors are like bank accounts on the first day of rehearsals. Want to fill those accounts full of new experiences and relationships so that the final product will be rich. He has a passion to rediscover what it is about Dracula, especially as there are already over 200 films about him. Why make it again? That is his quest. Tom Waits arrives straight off an old record cover in a 64 open-top Cadillac with fins, with a funnel of dust trailing down the dirt road. The gravel voice gets out some howdy doodies, and his clothes and hair are crumpled sculpted to him. Doesn't seem to have a straight bone in his bearing, and kills me off with his cool by growling out a compliment for Withnail out the side of his mouth, like we might be being spied on by the bailiffs. Him rolling tobacco and reefer. Winona and I are, we've got all your recordings, Tom, to which he just hehes. 4th of September. We meet at 9 a.m. to complete the read-through of the original novel, which we began yesterday. It's turgid. At the end, Francis drops this little bomb. Now you've read the novel. Anything you feel is missing from the script, please come tomorrow with suggestions and additions. So, there is method in his apparent madness, gets hummed and nodded around the table. 6th of September. A drama teacher from San Francisco arrives to help us improvise scenes, throw balls about, exchange hats, keep eye contact, and loosen up. Francis is bubbling today, and Humpty Dumpty is about delighted with this play, which he guides towards doing the actual scenes, which are very short, hoping that the improvisation will enrich and inform the way we do these pieces. A pianist has been employed to play classical music of the period for our dancing, and some ballet dancers arrive to writhe around Keanu for a scene he has when beset by Drax vamps. I throw myself into all this and enjoy it for what it is, but I know all too well that come the actual day, the role remains the same. But this equivocating is diverted by the late afternoon horse ride. Drama school was definitely not like this. Carrie Elwes, Keanu Reeves, Bill Campbell and I go careering off on a wild trail up the mountainside, through forest and up to the top. Exhilarating. Boys bonding stuff. At night homemade pizza, and then to a corner bar and basement joint in the cluster of shops nearby. Ping-pong table downstairs. Darts and customers in lumberjack gear. Anthony Hopkins is the only absentee. 
Everyone gets legless, and I may as well have been, cavorting about and gyrating in a last call at the singles bar frenzy to a succession of Aretha Franklin's greatest hits. Like an end-of-school exam party thrash, inhibition is so overthrown that I have no shame in singing a duet with Tom Waits. Hit the trampoline and pool for a cool-down session at 3 a.m. I'm young again! I'm young again! I hollow with each bounce on the trampoline. 7th of September. Three hours sleep, then the wake-up call to go hot air ballooning with Carrie and Bill. It's 6 a.m., and we're dressed in frock coats and top hats, and Francis is overseeing all this in pyjamas and dressing gown. Why are we doing this? It's not a scene from the film, but Francis has offered up this privilege as an experience that three of us could share. For the sheer grace of it. Whether this will profoundly affect the way we act our parts does not enter the equation just now. 14th of October. Sony Columbia Studios down in Culver City. The sound stages formerly crammed with Never Neverland sets are now Transylvania, London and the English countryside. High Gothic costumery, music relay through loudspeakers, a multitude of technicians, set dresses and scene painters, lighting, camera tracks, in fact, a big studio picture seen in old movie annuals, recreated and come to life. Everything is going to be shot on sound stages, making this an unusual production, since most films these days are shot on location. It feels incredibly exciting, and I am thrilled to the knicker to be a part of it. 17th of October, first screening of the player in Santa Monica, with a small invited audience, followed by dinner with the Altmans for the post-moviedom. An agent is discovered crying in an underground car park, having just seen the flick, bemoaning her life being so mercilessly portrayed in the film. Rumours that Range Rover sales among studio executives are going to go down as a result of the film in which Tim Robbins sleaze balls his way round makes for a lot of hype and haha. 7th of November. Lunatic Asylum set. The designer has created a realistic, dank, falling down interior, and it has been peopled by the weirdest humans Los Angeles has to offer. Aiko has designed metal cases to fit around the asylum keeper's heads, and the keepers have been cast to look like Viking Thors. A very intense young man, who is a bug trainer, is on hand with boxes of slugs, bugs and creepy crawlies for Tom Waits to work with. He produces a creature that wriggles around very effectively, but when touched, freezes as if dead. This enables Tom to choose one, pick it up, pop it into his mouth and pretend to chew without having to eat the thing. Gary is in a half-man, half-bat suit, ready to attack the posse, which includes Messrs. Hopkins, Elwes, Reeves, Campbell and Grant. A hairy all-in-one bodysuit has transformed Gary beyond all recognition, and his rage at us doubles the horror. By this, I mean that the makeup effects are grotesque in their own right, but such is the intensity of the performer within that you really do believe he is this monstrous incarnation. Gary never goes half measure on anything. During the shooting, Francis blindfolds the posse and has Gary whisper insults into our ears just to get us wound up even further. Wind machines, music, screaming, shouting, controlled chaos, plus rats and a rat trainer whose biggest assignment has been on Indiana Jones. My abiding image of Francis is of him standing amid mayhem, always at the epicentre of his own storm. Exactly what would overwhelm most other mortals fires Francis. As far as anyone thinks they are already reaching, Francis has a way of outdistancing even that. Whether or not Dracula is a masterpiece in the making seems irrelevant. The process is all. 7th of December. Week free. And I accompany Glenn Headley to the Kennedy Arts Awards in Washington, D.C. for a weekend of American high society for real. Dinner in the State Department ballroom, which is the grandest hobnobbing I have ever encountered. Anthony Hopkins is the only famous person in here whom I know to speak to, and he grins at me and says, They really do know how to do all this kind of thing. It's like a movie. Totally unreal. The tables all have name cards, and enough glass, crockery and cutlery to sink the armada all over again. The other guests at our round table for eight include a senator, George Baker, Martin Scorsese, and to my immediate left, Lauren Bacall. She has seen a screening of the player, which serves as an introduction. I knew in advance of this dinner that Scorsese was casting The Age of Innocence, as Winona had told me she was in it, and said I should get my agent to make appropriate noises, even though the main part was already cast with Daniel Day-Lewis. The film is set to go in March next year, a month after Dracula wraps. I resolved not to mention it in these surroundings, and asked him instead why New York, New York and King of Comedy were deemed failures in the States while acclaimed in Europe. Scorsese's film knowledge is legendary, but I am totally floored to discover that he has seen everything I have ever been in, including Hudson Hawk.
At this point, he mentions that I am on his casting list of possibles for Age of Innocence. I reckon that this opulent banqueting hall, dinner-jacketed and bejeweled up to the throttling nines, chit-chatting with Lauren Bacall and nodding appropriately at the ancient senator opposite, is the best impromptu audition for playing a society type in the Age of Innocence than anything anyone could have planned. 23rd of December Happy New Year, Swazi boy. A veritable hat-trick, Altman, Coppola and now Scorsese has come through with an offer of a part in the Age of Innocence. However, this excitement and jump up and down are put into perspective when I realise that my role is about 18 lines of dialogue. In other words, a glorified bit part. But for Scorsese, baby. 31st of January, 1992. Last day of Dracula, and I go to say thanks and goodbye to Francis and Keanu, who are on another soundstage shooting a vampire Valkyrie scene, where Keanu falls asleep in the Count's castle and finds that the floor is literally erupting with female vampires intent on getting a pint. As they still have a way to go to complete, there is no communal sense of it climaxing or curtain calling to an end. 1st of February. Fly home. 23rd of November, 1992. Man's Chinese Theatre on Hollywood Boulevard. Dracula premiere. About as big and brouhaha as it gets. Wachek Kila's pounding score fills the theatre, and for the first 40 minutes my jaw is dropped, trying to relate the experience of what we shot with what is up there on the screen and I know now that Francis is a techno-wizard. It's almost like an homage to every type of cinematic development over the past century. For sheer boldness and chutzpah, it is exhilarating. Age of Innocence, 26th of March, 1992. Costume fitting in a disused bank for Age of Innocence in New York. The costume assistant is male, mustachioed, sibilant, quaffed, witty, and knowingly widens an eyeball when I sniff the new leather gloves provided. Hair and makeup team are instantly familiar, caustic, campy, and deadly serious about whether or not to have sideburns or just a haircut. My costume is either a black tailcoat and tie ensemble or dandy summer white suit, all of which feel tight. 27th of March. Letter of welcome and compliments from Daniel De Lewis, written on parchment type paper that is unexpected and cheering. I've never had or heard of an actor doing this before. I am cast to play Larry Lefferts, a lounge lizard of the upper order, who spends his time philandering, gossiping, and trolling about. Edith Wharton describes him thus. One had only to look at him, from the slant of his bald forehead and the curve of his beautiful fair moustache to the long patent leather feet at the other end of his lean and elegant person, to feel that the knowledge of form must be congenital in anyone who knew how to wear such good clothes so carelessly and carry such height with so much lounging grace. Now, the effect on me of reading this assessment is twofold. Firstly, I assume I am this very creature, apart from the blonde moustache, and how astute of Mr. Scorsese to have cast me to play him. Each sentence is read as a personal insight, and by the end of the paragraph, I damn well believe I am this lounging lizard. Acting is simply transference, so long as you believe. But then, there is the insidious undertow of doubt. In casting me according to the type of Wharton's outline, does Scorsese know something about me that I don't? Has he rumbled the fact that I am a deeply superficial personage? 4th of April. Ten-day wait finally rewarded with the call to work. 7.30 p.m. pickup and off into Troy, upstate New York. Into a trailer and I'm greeted by a huge bunch of red roses and a welcome note from Marty. More blooms than I have lines to speak. I meet Dan, just back from his regular five-mile run around a school track. Miriam Margulies is in the makeup trailer pulling off her old age prosthetic and being complimented by the team for having broken down all formal barriers with the crew by showing her breasts. Hair trim and tong, thence to make up for the paintwork. Michelle Pfeiffer is in the adjacent chair with her hair in a stocking and face covered in pale base makeup, like fine bone china awaiting the glaze. I'd been told that she is sensitive and shy and had been warned to approach her with care, but come the face to face, my nerves have hit the question superhighway and I am off but my interrogation seems not to have caused offence, as she goes on to tell me about the trials of playing Catwoman in Batman, and going temporarily deaf wearing that tight mask, and having to get used to the clinging rubber suit that has to be smeared with silicone to make it shine and register in the dark. Michelle is not to be twisted, shaken, or rock-and-rolled at first encounter. However, she is wide-eyed when Miriam comes in and says how intimidated she was when first meeting her. "'What is it with you, English? I thought you were supposed to be shy and retiring, and us Americans all up front.' Slow forward to 12.30 a.m., freezing. 
outdoor scene involving Michelle and Daniel arranging a clandestine meeting that is seen by Lefferts. Horse and carriage, Annika Renner's style fur for Miss Pfeiffer, and snow-covered streets and gas lamps. As the story is made up of minute betrayals, of which this is one, nothing is deemed casual or arbitrary. Detail, detail, detail. Mr. Scorsese is no longer Marty in this situation. The work is, as Miriam said, very quiet, very concentrated, serious, intense. It's unusual to maintain the monastic mood among a hundred technicians. I pass Daniel, and he invites no greeting or exchange between takes. Is this his method in action? Assume so. Four hours pass with repeated walk-bys from me rehearsing my surprised, what are you two doing here, look? 4.45 a.m. The carriage action and dialogue is completed with camera and lights turning around to film my contribution. Half-hour wait. Into makeup for touch-ups. Dan comes in, all smiles, and we chat. He has totally transformed from the remote, steely suspicion maintained earlier as Newland Archer. The unspoken rule, I assume, is that when in character, Lefferts is his enemy, and when working, he will not speak to me. Marty comes in, jokes, and hopes we can get the shot before dawn breaks. Despite the hour and the cold, he is obviously happy to be making this film. Makes me think, even from our few encounters, that for him, film is elemental. His fifth, beyond earth, air, fire, and water. My walk by and eyebrow raise is straightforward, two takes and we are done. But the daft relief and pleasure of actually having pleased this man and doing something floods my tired old veins with glee. 6th of April. Message from Winona Ryder to come round to her apartment en route to the player premiere. She is my date for the evening. The premiere is only a couple of blocks away at the Ziegfeld Cinema, and we walk. Will the player play? It does. Good laughs and solid outbreaks of applause of the apparently genuine kind. Party after at the Hard Rock Café. Lauren Hutton introduces herself and says the day they make a movie about the late designer Halston, I will certainly get the call as his exact look-alike. Maybe it's my polo neck and black jacket. Whoopi Goldberg invites a bunch of us to her suite in the nearby St. Regis Hotel where Annie Ross gives an impromptu repertoire of songs. Peter Gallagher and his wife Paula appear later after his performance in Guys and Dolls. Volume level is set at raucous and alcohol around inebriate. An industry and critical hit, and I wish Joan was here to share this with. Walk back pondering the Geldof query. Is this it? Stop off in an all-night deli. Buy a tub of haagen rum and raisin ice cream, scoff the lot, only to witness it reappear in the bathroom and disappear down the cone-shaped basin. To bed. 11th of June. Library scene with Alec McCown and Daniel Day-Lewis, cigars and whiskey. Final day for Alec and me. As the final cut is called, Marty leads a round of applause and thanks Alec and me for being here and for doing such small roles so perfectly, all of which was welcome embarrassment. 12th of June. 6 p.m. flight to London, 6.30 a.m. arrival, an odd cocktail of yippee and what next? Pret-a-Porter, autumn 1993. The relief and excitement when I get the call from Robert Altman cannot be overstated. Are you going to do the movie or what? Well, you know the deal. There's no money, Paris for two months, models, multiple stories, no real lead roles. What do you say? Flick fast through the script for pret porte and count up number of times Court Romney, my designer character, a male version of Vivian Westwood, appears. Late February 1994, we meet at Vivian Westwood's workshop in Battersea. A dozen chain smokers and the apparent chaos of a fringe theatre wardrobe circa 1979, complete with Miss Westwood in platforms, fake fur, exhaustion and peroxide hair. Her Paris show is three weeks away and she leaves us with her team to squirrel out clothes. 5th of March, 1994. Flight to Paris for pret a and as my guts take to the sky, there is sink, plunge, and panic. Who will believe me as a male incarnation of Miss Westwood? To the production office off the Champs-Élysées, and what a thrill and privilege to be paid to be here. The office is a bilingual, smoke-filled warren of people experiencing pre-shoot anxiety. Sally Kellerman is five inches taller than me, trying on a pair of Japanese-style Vivian Westwood mules in the wardrobe room, and it takes all my self-control not to yell out, Howdy, hot lips, Houlihan! She plays Sissy Wanamaker, editor of Harper's Bazaar. 6th of March. After a clear-skied trip up the Eiffel, we throng to the glass pyramid in the middle of the Louvre, where we are to attend a fashion show. 
thousands of people dressed in licorice all sorts. We're escorted to the backstage loading zone. The TV monitor on the white ramp is intermittently watched by Miss Westwood, who is transfixed and intent, and apart from her visibly fluttering diaphragm, seems calm. Dressed in pearls, caramel beige sweater and matching trousers, she could be housewife ubiquitous. But her shoes are twelve-inch tartan platforms, and I don't think she's wearing a bra. We are surrounded by flamingo-legged models, lengthened forever by the various boots and shoes with the cartoon high heels, in various states of undress and redress. They are all here, Naomi Campbell, Kate Moss, Linda Evangelista. They all seem to be dragging on fags and slurping champagne from plastic cups or are being trussed into miles of tulle, tight-fitting bodices, corsets, bustles, hats, jackets, coats and leggings. Being in the midst of all this is undeniably thrilling. I'm then seated with Azadine Alaya, Claudia Cardinale and Diane von Fustenberg. This is a reality wobble, like Vanity Fair for real. Each model, isolated, lit, and slinking down the runway, has an hypnotic effect quite separated from the hands-on fix, zip, and pit-stop profusion witnessed earlier. They really do seem to have been made, for surely no human ever had legs that long, a face that cheekboned, or salary that high, for walking without talking in someone else's clothes. Go back to my hotel on the metro, among the legging and anorak reality of Paris street life. 8th of March. At noon, I am picked up by the driver and taken to the Carousel du Louvre, and I am met by an assistant and marched off to the makeshift dressing room and make-up area, where I see Rupert Everett. He used to be as skinny as me, and I am amazed at his physical transformation, his arms now thicker than my thighs and neck as wide as his jaw. How do you do it? Gym every day. Why? Sex. Touché. I am sent off with a video crew to film walking through a crowd of fashion victims in the foyer. Get stared at and photographed, then ushered to a front row seat for Chantal Thomas's lingerie collection. What follows is forty minutes of turbocharged teenage underwear fantasia. Cher slips into the vacant seat beside me as the lights dim. She is dressed top to toe in leather designed by Chrome Hearts. Monsieur Pierre, chief talent scout from the elite modeling agency, asks if I will have dinner with Naomi Campbell, Kate Moss, Johnny Depp, and Christy Turlington at Natasha's restaurant, followed by a party for Naomi at Le Palais Club. In the name of research, I agree. The supermodels push their food around their plates, and I wonder whether they ever eat anything. Naomi assures me she eats like a horse. About four jumbo packs of Marlboros are inhaled in between details of who is with who and who is in town and what happened at this show. They tell me that the girls are incredibly supportive of one another and not bitchy at all, and it would take armor plating not to be charmed by their sheer form. So fresh, so young, so tall, and so thin. Johnny Depp, whom I first met when he was with Winona Ryder, and who still bears her name tattooed on his shoulder, is apparently possessed of Kate Moss. They look like brother and sister, blowing smoke into each other's faces between kisses. To the Palais Club for Naomi's party. Naomi pays me the compliment that I can dance, having clearly anticipated the Prince Charles School of Rhythm and Blues, and I bleat for some inanity about having grown up in Africa by way of explanation. At some point, lung seizure begins to feel an imminent reality, so I boldly squash towards the loo and meet Donovan en route, as in Son of Donovan, purveyor of sweet seventies folksiness. How old must I be, here in the seventies time warp, to meet this adult pop star with an eyelid of smudged mascara? It transpires he is a Withnell and I fan. Fast forward to when I am toothless and bald and still meeting the trendies who adopt and hold dear that vision of London life. 10th of March. Tracy Ullman is a self-confessed fashion obsessive, and we go to the Chanel show together. Time to meet Carl, Kaiser Supremo of the fashion world Lagerfeld, who, we have been informed, has decided against appearing in the film and has barred any filming at his show. It is therefore with some trepidation that we seek an audience with the potentate, who is short, bulgy, and sweating like a pack horse, despite the constant fan at his face. The half-shaded sunglasses do not disguise the obvious foundation of makeup and lip liner, and he speaks at Scorsese speed with a German accent. Andre Leon Talley yells into view. He is the giant artistic director of American Vogue, a Savile Row suited dandy with a booming southern voice and the only black man encountered in this strange cosmos. This seems to be the show most eagerly awaited so far. Andre Leon Talley guides Tracy and me backstage. He is in a state of near euphoria, and the words genius, genius, genius flute forth. We are guided like heat-seeking missiles to where Carl is sweating in the afterglow of his latest triumph. Andre insists we do breakfast at the Ritz. 
Naomi is wearing eyeball-swiveling lingerie that could be comfortably packaged in a matchbox, inducing near-fatal thrombotics from the old prostate in pinstripes. 11th of March. My first proper filming call is scheduled for early evening at a famed restaurant in the gardens near the Place de la Concorde. Jula Bulgari is the party host in conjunction with the film production. Now this is true Altmanism, a bona fide event interwoven with film actors playing characters attending the kind of party usually created in a film studio. I do not expect to see Sophia Loren and Marcella Mastrioni chatting to one another in dressing gowns and hair curlers, but they are. It is with some trepidation that I get my Vivian Westwood gear on, as is its first outing in the film. The eighteenth century white makeup, beauty spot, and kiss curled hair help me feel hidden before I strap into the crotch high black boots with the twelve inch heels, dinner jacket, hat, pearl earrings, and gold penis shaped cufflinks, plus floor length velvet double breasted coat. I take a very deep breath before sallying forth into the critical eye storm of the other thesps. Lauren Bacall guffaws her disbelief, while others offer approval, especially La Lorraine, which is no small encouragement at this point. Helmut Newton, the legendary German lensman, is here to cover the night, and is much taken with the sheer endless length of my boots. Once costumed and boofed, we are trooped off in small groups to be mixed into the real party. I meet up with Vivian Westwood, who wholly approves the character before her, and I feel that her reaction at this point is as important as Mr. Altman's. 1 a.m. rap. 21st of March. Vivian Westwood and I go off to the canteen for dinner, and she fills me in on a couple of things I would like you to think about and possibly incorporate. This results in two hours of a unique personal history and philosophy, covering everything from her relationship with Malcolm McLaren, how punk came to be, numerous quotations from Oscar Wilde, her sons, her theory of beauty, and her great passion to form a salon for artists and thinkers, like they had then, all punctuated with constant sigs, all of which might have ballooned pretentiously were they not couched in her resolutely northern solid sounds, which make even the most bizarre and extreme thoughts seem quite reasonable to my ignorant ears. Most of all, her passion for clothes and everything to do with them is as relentless as a heartbeat, the cut, the cut, the cut, the feel of the fabric. I am brain-buzzed with everything she has related, and wonder how much, if any, I can transmute into my part. But know that whatever, the opportunity to meet someone like her and everyone else extraordinary on this film is what makes this job seem the most wonderful and privileged of professions to be in. 8th of December, 1994. Pret-a-Porter Premier, New York, Ziegfeld Theatre. Click, click, flash, flash, shout, shout. Shift and throng around the crowds, rubbernecking the foyer for more famous faces and into the theatre. Immaculately turned out couture offset by gallon-sized tubs of popcorn and Diet Coke. Lauren Bacall and Jean-Paul Gautier are sitting just behind, Sophia Loren to the right. Scenes are applauded, and the whole thing goes by without my being able to tell what is really thought or felt. Altman said he thought it would be a couple of moons before the film would be evaluated for what it actually is, rather than the media hullabaloo of what it was expected to be. Epilogue Having been briefed to convert my private diary into a fleshed-out public screed, which seemed like an impossibly daunting task at the start of the year, I have now completed it. From the handing over in June ninety-five of the manuscript to the final edit in December, I have been struck by the parallels with the filmmaking process. First, the big thrill is the day you are told, it's you we want, either to act or to write. The project, cash and confidence-boosting carrier bag is the same. It's followed by the acute anxiety that rears up bellowing, how in hell am I ever going to do this? a day at a time, page by page, scene by scene, slowly, until you have completed either film or full scap. I was commissioned to write 100,000 words, can't count, and delivered 187,000. Likewise, the average 100-minute film regularly runs twice that length when rough cut together for the first time. Then the hacking commences, by a highly astute human who edits the performance or prose into something people might want to watch or read. By the time it is ready for delivery, Another year has lived by, and now it's time to get out of the house and sell. Something that is already a thing of the past. I can't think of any other profession in which you are so acutely dealing in time, simultaneously creating something in the present, from what is written in the past, to be released in the future, and then judged in the present. Writing this epilogue is as peculiar as writing your own epitaph, before actually being boxed up and buried. I had hoped for some wisdom at the cramped end of my thirties, 
but feel my hand moving inexorably towards my forehead in a gesture of nay, nay. What I do know is this. No matter how intense, important, life-alteringly fabulous or fiasco-laden a flick is, it finally is just that, a flick, of the fast-forward button or fade-out. This year's must-see is destined to shuffle itself onto the overstocked video shelf six months after its release. I ponder the question that's always asked. Did you know at the time you were destined to be in a hit or a howler? And apart from an unequivocal no, three answers spring forth. Casablanca was considered unreleasable, the Dakota Plain unflyable, and the Titanic unsinkable. The other most commonly asked question is the double-barreled shotgun, what's next? If you aren't working, it's tantamount to an accusation, and if you are, an affirmation, guaranteed only till the last day of your present contract. If acting is a license, I'd like my car to be fully comprehensive until such time as my motor gives out. Adieu.